Book Committee. Uh, we're courted, we are, um, and we, we, we got a briefing earlier from Barbara in relation to one of the topics. Uh, we're now in open session, and uh, today's meeting will include briefings from the Department on the Future Rural Affairs Policy. Claire Morris, uh, Patsy, um, Claire Morris, Patsy and Philip will be joining uh, by, uh, uh, by Starleaf. And as usual, the, we know that the meeting will be recorded and broadcast throughout Parliament buildings and online. And you can use mobile dev devices provided there in airplane mode. We have no apologies. And uh, in terms of um, item, uh, item one, no, I have no apologies. Item two, in terms of chairperson's business, uh, the uh, Fisheries Bill received royal assent on the 23rd of November and is now known as the Fisheries Act 2020. I want to refer members to the draft minutes from the meeting of the 19th of November, page 7 to 7, 7 Members, okay if I sign the minutes? Okay. Um, I want to advise members in terms of item 4 in terms of matters rising uh, that, as agreed at last week's meeting, a, 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 a request was made to the Department for oral evidence session on Project Stratum. The Department has since advised that Project Stratum is a, is a Department for Economy Strategic Broadband Project and DFE are responsible for its overall funding, tendering and delivery. The project is managed through the Project Stratum Project Board. Here I have a representative on this board to provide opinion and input, etc. on the rurality aspect of the project. Um, we also wish to note that the, the Economy Committee has requested a written briefing on this project, including the proposed timelines and postcode. Uh, the Committee may seek um, an oral briefing, an oral briefing from officials in the Department of the Economy. Members, okay, we seek an oral briefing from uh, officials in the Department of the Economy. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think that's important because whilst it's been led by the Department of the Economy, uh, there are major stakeholders, and of course, the Department has done 50 million, 50 million into, this, into the uh, 165 million pot. Okay. Um, okay. So. We're going to move on now to item five in the agenda. We're going to have an oral uh, uh, evidence session from DERA on the Rural Policy Framework. Um, if members refer to 17 to 52 on your packs, I'd like to take this opportunity now to welcome via Starleaf Paul Donnelly, the Director of Rural Affairs, Gareth Evans, Leader and, and Rural Tourism and Implementation Manager, <coughs> and Fiona McCandless, uh, Deputy Secretary. And uh, I'd like to invite you at this point to commence your briefing, and then we'll take uh, some questions afterwards. Okay. Good morning. Oh, can't hear you. Can't hear you. There's something. Good morning. Good morning. Can hear you, Paul. Gareth. Fiona, I think was talking there. We couldn't hear. Can't hear. Can't hear Gareth or Fiona. What's going on? Yeah. Ah, we hear you now, Fiona. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, do you want to check off whoever wants to? Or? Lost you again, Fiona. Uh, and Gareth as well. I can't hear Fiona or Gareth. Well, ask Paul just to start. Paul, do you want to maybe start off there? Would that be all right to order to get overcome the technical difficulties? Yeah, Paul. Okay, Mr. Chair. Hey, thank okay. you, Paul. Come on. Uh, we're lost in all three years now. <laughs> Not good. Can't hear any of three years. Okay, yeah. Paul, you're coming in now. Uh, right. Um, apologies. Chair, I'm wondering, can you hear me at this yes. stage? Yes, Fiona, I can hear you at this stage, yes. Okay, oh, listen, I'm really apologies for, we seem to be having a bit of difficulty there, but uh, I'll maybe start, and thank you very much, Mr Chairman, for this opportunity to provide the committee with an update on the work relating to the development of the future rural policy framework. 
I'm in company today and, and hopefully we'll get to hear from them uh, with Paul Donnelly, as you say, and with Gareth Evans, who's been leading the work and the development of the framework. You'll have already received some written briefing on the matter uh, from the Department's Days and Officer, and hopefully you find that useful. So, as you'll be aware, the key rural policy driver for almost the past 30 years has been set by the EU Rural Development Funding Programmes, currently funded from Pillar 2 of the EU Common Agricultural Policy. So, Priority 6 of the current RDP from 2014 to 2020 provides general support for rural communities to tackle poverty and isolation and support economic development. Priority 6 is more commonly known as the Leader Programme. It's an EU-supported bottom-up delivery mechanism seeking local input to inform and animate community involvement in the identification of local issues and needs. The current leader programme provides investment support of 70 million and is delivered by the local action groups in each of the 10 council areas, excluding Belfast. Leader primarily provides investment support for job creation in rural business, provision of rural basic services, village renewal plans and cooperation activities. And a further 10 million is also available to support rural tourism, Valley Fidera, in partnership with local government and statutory bodies. The leader is making and has continues to make a very positive contribution to the economic social sectors for rural areas, to the over 60 million funding made available for business and community focused projects. And in particular, the rural business investment scheme has been contributing to the rural economy, successfully improving economic outcomes for people in these areas through increased employment opportunities. Under the business scheme, local action groups have issued letters of offer to the value of 21 million, leaving in just over 23 million in private sector match funding, with 898 full time equivalent jobs being created. We also have the rural tourism budget of 10 million, creating innovative visitor attractions in rural areas to encourage out of state visitors. And to date, we've had 15 projects approved to receive funding. 7.35 million in total, including Gosford Glen, Alpine Toboggan, Davop Forest Park, Dark Sky Observatory, Gosford Forest Street Play Park Trail, Valley Copeland Windmill, Castlewell and Arboretum, and Hillsborough Forest Digital Sculpture Trail. So, in view of EU exit and the impending cessation of the EU support initiative, such as Leader, Rural Affairs Division have been taking forward work to develop the new rural policy framework, which will help inform what's needed to support rural communities going forward in the future and consideration of future interventions to support rural development post EU exit. And significant stakeholder engagement has taken place in relation to this, and there's been five working groups established around thematic pillars as follows. Innovation and entrepreneurship, sustainable tourism, health and well-being, employment and connectivity. And Gareth is going to give you some more detail on the development work and engagement that's been taken forward to date. But just before that, I just want to comment a bit on the impact that COVID has had on our progression of the work and our approach to rural policy going forward. So the EU Commission have extended the current leader in tourism schemes until 2023, and that has provided very welcome relief to delivery partners, given the impact of COVID on construction and service delivery. And this extension has also provided staff with the space to take forward very pressing work supporting rural communities. Since the onset of COVID, Rural Affairs Division have focused resources supporting rural communities and businesses respond and recover from the impact of the restrictions on how people live. We've prioritised getting funding on the ground, and since April, almost £13 million pounds of grant funding has been paid to rural businesses and rural communities from the Rural Development Programme. And that's playing a key role in maintaining community and business sustainability so that rural areas are well placed to recover strongly from the pandemic. In addition, rural affairs staff have worked closely with delivery partners on the Tackling Rural Poverty and Social Isolation Programme to support the most vulnerable rural dwellers. This year, the Minister secured a budget of £10.8 million for Tripsy, and that's played a key role in supporting rural individuals, community and businesses respond. We've done things like ac provide access to food, to transport, telephony support, medicine and health and wellbeing services. And more recently, support schemes have been launched to support rural community groups and businesses make capital adaptations to their facilities, enabling them to function and adhere to the COVID restrictions. And that includes the provision of two million to the council-led revitalisation scheme to support rural settlements. We have over 20 initiatives underway as part of the Tripsy programme. 
And although COVID, to some extent, has delayed the rural policy framework, it has provided the opportunity to further test assumptions from the policy development work and, very importantly, assist COVID recovery. And this has been achieved by Rural Affairs Division launching a number of pilot schemes since March. And Garth will give you some more detail on that, but they include the Rural Business Micro Growth Scheme, the Web Development Scheme, the Rural Tourism Collaborative Experience Programme, and the Rural Social Economy and Investment Scheme. So these pilots have helped us respond to COVID, but also importantly, provide valuable insight into what the rural needs are and to help our approach to the policy framework necessary to support sustainable rural community and business going forward. The first draft has nearing completion at this stage, with the exception of integrating the evidence from the pilot schemes, and this will be added shortly. And I hope to return soon to update you on the plans for public consultation. But by way of background and update in the policy framework, Chair, if you're content, I'd like to hand over to Gareth. He'll talk you through the document that we've previously supplied. And we'll be happy to take any questions following Gareth's briefing. Thank you, Chair. Hi. Oh, hopefully you can hear me now. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so the the, docu the document we've put forward, um, you can either try and follow it through the pages, or if you're happy enough just to listen in, that's it's up to yourself. Um, the first thing I say at the outset is. I'm, I'm in rural development for 19 years and we've never undertaken a piece of work like this before. It's, um, I think it shows the seriousness that, that the department puts on rural development and particularly on rural communities and, and keeping them sustainable. So at the very outset, um, we, we agreed we would uh, develop a rural policy framework. And the framework is basically de uh, designed around five thematic pillars. And under each thematic pillar, uh, there are a number of priority areas for intervention. And these, these are the, uh, what we wanted to research and then develop, and part particularly research the need under each of them. Um, once, once we then have that uh, in the framework, the framework will then be taken and we will develop individual schemes to address individual need under those priority areas of uh, intervention. Um, further down the line, we will then be looking next year at developing those into a program. Uh, so, by, by way of giving you a, a progress update, um, with a slide there, just giving you the progress to date. Um, before, before we go on to look at each of the pillars, we'll just quickly run, run through that. So, a way back, believe it or not, in November uh, 2018, uh, RDC, or Rural Action as they are now, had a rural stakeholder event in Lockery where they brought in um, many rural stakeholders to get their opinion on what rural development uh, should look like going into the future. And out of that, um, the department recognised the need to do some do an individual piece of work to take that forward. And that's really where the first um, inkling of these five thematic pillars actually appeared. So on the back of uh, that event in November, the department then formed a project board. And the project board was made up of representatives from across all government departments. Um, the, the project board took the five thematic pillars and we did a bit of work around those. And then to, to keep stakeholders on board, we then formed a Rural Society Stakeholder Forum. And that was drawn from uh, people who were at the event, the RDC event in uh, November. So that, that uh, forum met a couple of times. And then in April last year, um, we agreed the five thematic pillars and we agreed the approach that we would actually take to develop in these um, further. So the, the agreement was that we would actually, um, for each pillar, we would form a working group, and that working group would be made up of uh, departmental officials, uh, other agencies, departments, and most importantly, rural stakeholders. Um, so we, we established those five groups. Each group was chaired by uh, a member of staff from Rural Affairs, and we we picked staff who 
um, are well experienced in delivering programs and projects. Um, but their role, and I want to emphasize this, was only to chair. Um, the input really did come from the, the members of each of those working groups. So each, each working group was tasked with going off and producing a report. And uh, those reports uh, would then eventually come in and they would form the basis of the, the actual framework uh, to keep everybody up to date. Uh, during the process, the, um, the board was supplied with highlight reports just showing the progress uh, as we worked our way through. So round about November, December last year, the final reports um, were submitted by each of the working groups and those were then collated by ourselves. And we decided then that it, it was worth actually, even before we started um, drafting the framework, to let rural stakeholders have a view of, of the information that had come in. So we had an event in Lockery in January last year, and I know some of the members of the committee attended that. We had 124 uh, stakeholders at the event um, which totally took us back because we kind of thought if we got 50 or 60, we'd be doing well. Um, so to get 124, we're extremely pleased about. Um, we then basically, each working group gave a presentation on what they had done and, and more or less what their findings were at that point in time. And uh, everybody at the event was given the opportunity then to sit down and discuss each of the presentations. And from that, we, we took away some comments. Uh, I would have to say from um, being a member of staff involved in this, uh, we were overly um, surprised at how well people responded to what we presented uh, on the day. And the, I suppose the, the lasting memory of the day was that everybody was extremely happy with what we we're doing, but everybody flagged up that the one major rural issue was rural broadband. Uh, and that was agreed by uh, everybody at, at the meeting. So, <clears throat> excuse me, following that meeting, we then took the reports away. We took some more comments from each of the, um, from each of the discussion groups at the event, and we started to work on the framework. And if I'm being honest, we made fairly good ground, probably February, March, and then uh, the inevitable happened, as everybody knows, and COVID kicked in. That, uh, severely impacted work um, because it restricted our ability to go out and actually discuss face to face some some of the uh, findings within the, the working groups. But more importantly, um, I think it put a lot of pressure on our on the department to actually start responding to COVID. So we actually did have to start moving some of our resource around. Um, but it also gave us the opportunity to test some of the assumptions coming out of the working groups. And we very quickly, um, with ministerial approval, made the decision to start actually developing some pilots to test the assumptions that we had uh, had been developed from the working groups. So um, we put a number of pilots together, and some of those pilots have already launched. And the aim was to try and get some funding out to rural businesses and rural communities. And as I say, also take the opportunity to test the assumptions coming out of the working groups. Um, the, uh, just, just going back to the membership, and I think this is, the, this is the, one, the one key point I'd really like to get across. We really cast the net far and wide when we were trying to form the working groups. So we simply didn't go out and, and pluck a couple of people um, from the rural communities and, and kind of stick them in to tick a box. We didn't do that. So uh, one of the slides there, there's a couple of slides give you a breakdown of the organizations that we had under each of the, um, the themes, the, the working group thing, themes. So we did have people like Invest NI, we had um, community, uh, community groups like Rapid who have been involved around rural funding for many, many years, Northern Ireland Women's Network. But there's, there's a, a, a list there. We had, we, we think overall, we had over 20 organizations represented and we held over 24 meetings across the, the five working groups. That was face-to-face -face meetings. Um, we also then had a number of uh, government departments and again, local authorities and importantly, uh, local action groups. And they were all represented 
uh, on the working groups as well. Um, so to give you a, a little uh, bit of a flavour for um, what the working groups were looking at and, and, a, and a high level of some of the, the main things coming out of the work they did. So the working group one uh, looked at innovation and entrepreneurship. And one of the key things that came across from, uh, and I actually attended a couple of meetings of this working group as an observer, so which was quite interesting. So one of the things that came across from the stakeholders was that we needed to start doing things differently, that simply handing grants out to businesses um, wasn't been, wasn't the best way to develop those businesses and make them sustainable. And that one of the key things going forward, if we want to grow a rural economy, is to look at innovation and entrepreneurship and that that should be at the core of anything we do uh, under business. So that, 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 was, that was the main theme that had, uh, had come out under that, that, um, that particular working group. And the areas that, some of the areas that they thought then should be priorities for intervention, um, we, we had three <laughs> areas came out. But really the, the main, I suppose, overarching issue was that we should try to develop a culture of innovation and raise awareness around entrepreneurship because it's only by doing that that we'll actually grow the economy. If we simply just keep um, giving funding out to businesses to, to go from one year to the, ne the next, we won't actually grow the economy. And it's only by growing the economy that we'll actually increase uh, jobs and increase the wealth within rural areas. Um, the other One of the other uh, themes then Working Group 2 looked at was rural tourism, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, for, many, for many years, the department has been criticized that we have, we've actually provided funding for rural tourism because it probably, at a, at a first glance, doesn't sit well with the department because we're not a tourist department. However, one of the key findings that came out of this group was that uh, some of the, some of the um, funding that we have been developing over the, particularly the last program, is actually starting to make a significant difference. And instead of looking at small bit piece um, rural tourism projects, taking it up a level where you can actually increase the numbers of people uh, fairly dramatically coming into an area and then hopefully getting the spin off within the businesses within that area. And that was something that was really reinforced by the working group. And they thought that some of the, the key interventions going forward um, really has to be that we need to look at high quality, sustainable tourism um, and unique experiences. So, you know, to create, not, not create um, Titanic or the um, Giants Causeway, but certainly create projects that can, um, can actually challenge those and, and bring people out and maybe bring people away from the Giants Causeway to spend an extra day uh, somewhere inland. Um, but it, it was very much the case that certainly what the department doing, was doing in rural tourism wasn't far off the mark, but we maybe slightly needed to refocus. Um, it was also, uh, also coming out of tourism, there was very much an opinion that rural communities need to get more involved in tourism as communities. So uh, one, of, one, of the, one of the things came out of it that was very interesting was tidy towns. It's, some, it's something we actually don't do in Northern Ireland, but um, as somebody sitting in Donegal here at the minute, it's, it's very prevalent here. And it actually came out from the working group that things like tidy towns involves the local community, but they, also, they, um, they enhance the local community, but they also make it more attractive to tourists. So there are things like that, that um, we need to probably start to look at. We also need to look at how we can maintain our built heritage and not forgetting about our natural and cultural environment because those are things which many overseas visitors come to see. Um, <clears throat> moving on then to probably the biggest um, area, and certainly the, the area where, which the most work uh, was contributed to was social well-being. Um, and th that thematic pillar uh, has always, uh, the, the, um, the kind of headings under that pillar of social isolation, exclusion, health and well-being, those have always been around, but I think what this allowed us to do is, is to have a really good refocus of those again. And particularly on the back of COVID, um, I think those issues came right to the fore. Um, so the, work, the working group uh, looked at a number of priority areas. 
And needless to say, um, this working group probably came up with more areas um, for priority intervention than anybody else. Um, but I think uh, one of the key things coming out was uh, DERA has a very, very important role as rural champion. And it's one certainly supported by the minister. And it's one that um, we can't do everything. And when you look at, at the issues that come and the need that comes out of social well-being, there's no way the department will ever be able to address everything. But I think we have a very important role as rural champion. And that is something that was very well supported by the working group. Um, one of the other key things was that we need to, we need to have a, a very close examination of our rural infrastructure and our community assets and make sure that those are actually, um, that they're fit for purpose. Um, we have invested greatly over the years in uh, a, a lot of new developments. And I think one of the things coming out of the working group was that um, don't forget about the uh, infrastructure that's already there and the fact that that actually has to be fit for purpose. And as, as legislation moves on, I mean, simplistic things like disabled legislation has made a, a big difference um, to what people expect and want. And th those, uh, those expectations aren't always been met. And that's something that we should, should be looking at. It also said that the heart of the, our, our villages and rural areas are absolutely key and that those, those should be thriving, um, living, uh, as, uh, as the department says, li living uh, um, an active landscape, you know, places where people want to, want to live. Um, and again, if you look at COVID, the, the idea of people now not moving out uh, and having to travel to Belfast or, or Derry or wherever, I think comes to the fore again. So the heart of the village is really important. Um, but the key, the key thing I think coming out of it really was that infrastructure is uh, very, very important. Um, employment, uh, or as, as somebody said, again, I went to one of the meetings and the start of the meeting said the lack of, um, and again, on the back of COVID, this is something that's going to put rural communities under a lot of pressure, is a lack of employment. But one of the, one of the main findings of this group was actually the, the basic skill set of people in rural areas and that sometimes not having a basic skill set can be a barrier to actually getting employment in the first place. Um, so what we need to be looking at is building the capacity of the workforce, developing their basic skills and, and giving them uh, the skills that allow them to then actually uh, uh, apply for jobs um, on, a, on maybe a level playing field with, with other people. Um, the other thing as well that came out of employment was that uh, we need to start getting people to start developing their own small businesses and we need to encourage them. And if we can do that, then we have an automatic link between that back to the first innovation and entrepreneurship working group. So, you know, you, you could see a, um, a case where if we can develop, uh, start and start, start small businesses and they get on their feet, they can then move, move through um, onto the other working group and get support to expand and maybe employ more people going forward. Um, the last thematic pillar, and probably the one, as I said, at, at the conference, uh, it came out as the number one issue is connectivity. Um, straight away, whenever we say connectivity, everybody thinks broadband, but the actual working group worked wider than that. They looked at things like rural transport, like uh, even infrastructure between um, urban and uh, rural areas. But without a doubt, the, the absolute um, key priority coming out of it was broadband. Um, and I suppose, again, going back to COVID, that, that has come to the fore. So uh, the, um, going, going forward then, uh, sorry, the stakeholder event, just to give you a very quick synopsis of the stakeholder event. As I've said, we, we had 124 attendees that's more than we've ever had at any event um, we've ever had in the past. We had uh, several committee members there, and that was very much appreciated um, by the department. Um, we were very keen to see that representation there because I think it, it lets people see the importance that both ourselves and yourselves are, are putting on this piece of work. Um, they all, all, all the working groups gave a five minute presentation and then a 20 minutes uh, roundtable talk. Um, 
there was an uh, overarching endorsement for everything that we had in the framework and many people actually commented that it was good to see the department um, I think one person said to me, and I, I kind of looked at them, it's good to see the department taking rural development seriously for a change. Um, but they took it a, a piece of salt. But Chair, maybe I'm just conscious of, of the time as well. And I suppose as we talk about the, uh, the interest from the members in the event, I just am conscious that we'd want to keep a bit of time for questions. So maybe if we move on, if, if you're content, yeah. Um, just to try and make sure that we allow some time for some feedback on, on that briefing, which I hope you did find informative. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can quickly wrap this up, Fiona. I mean, I think um, if we move on to the pilot schemes, um, I said earlier, the reason for developing the pilot schemes, COVID was putting a lot of pressure on rural businesses. We were aware that Brexit was around the corner. And the, the, one of the other main issues is we realise that one programme is coming to an end. And inherently in the past, we've always had all nearly always a two year gap and we didn't want to see a gap, but we also knew that we, we could test some of the findings coming out of the working groups. So we have started to, to launch a number of pilots. We have had a, a rural a rural micro business growth scheme and that scheme, uh, there's now 27 applications with the department and those will be assessed uh, over the next two to three weeks. And we would hope to have letters of offer out um, this side of Christmas, if possible. Um, we've had a website development scheme, and that was particularly targeted at tourism businesses, um, because one of the things out of COVID they discovered was that they didn't have a presence online, and therefore they lost out. Um, so we're, work we're working on that with uh, Tourism Northern Ireland. Uh, collaborative experience program, we're working with local councils to develop um, many media packages that uh, highlight the places to go, the things to do, and a lot of their small tourist businesses, which they can then use to promote the area. We are, and I think this uh, this is one that is um, focused on quite a lot through Leader. We are hopefully in uh, early January going to launch a rural, uh, sorry, a micro food business investment scheme. That was something we've been asked to do many times through Leader, and we were unable to do it. So we're going to launch a pilot project now in, in January, looking at that. And we currently have a rural social economy scheme open. Um, and that is, we've had two webinars with over 100 um, community, uh, sorry, social economy enterprises and community interest companies attending those. And that closes on the 11th of December. Um, we are further looking then at developing um, another couple of uh, pilots, one around uh, micro business uh, digital investment, and that is to make best advantage of Project Stratum rolling out uh, as we go forward, that people actually have the equipment and infrastructure to benefit from it, and also then a micro business web development scheme. And that was highlighted because of the success of the tourism one. Um, so th those are rolling out as, as we go forward. Um, next steps, there, there's a number of next steps. I'm not, I'm not going to go through the slide. I, um, you'll be on, only too aware of, of what we need to do with a framework to get it to the point of publicizing it, but we would hope to have uh, a final draft with yourselves early in the new year for approval and then also in the executive. Okay, thank you okay. For, for that, um, Gareth. That was a, a very, very um, helpful and very um, detailed. A briefing. I'm going, to, I'm going to move swiftly to members because we're, we're starting to get tight now for uh, our next witnesses. Um, there, there's, a couple, there's, there's a couple of points I just want to mention here um, for any of the three years. Um, obviously, one of them is to do with, with the funding of it. You know, we, we've seen in recent times there's been no progress made on the UK Shared Prosperity Fund. And we also seen um, a, a correspondence we have today and a an, um, statement from the Minister that the British government, which I believe is a very bad act of bad faith, isn't allowing us isn't allowing us to carry over uh, the funding. Uh, well, they are allowing us to carry over the funding from the the rural development programme, but they're actually deducting that there from the, the grant or the uh, replacement funding that they're providing to us. So, what's your assessment of that there in terms of actual funding being available for, <coughs> for implementing this programme, the new programme? 
Maybe, Chair, if you can hear me okay, I'll start with that. I'll just say that as part of the budget exercise, we have submitted bids, you know, in order to support our own business and community. Um, as you know, the, the Minister has written to the DEFRA Secretary of State expressing his concern at, um, in relation to your point that uh, the UK government um, is netting off the funding that is available at the moment uh, through Pillar 2, and he's expressed his concern and disappointment at that and requesting for full EU replacement funding in order that we can benefit from the opportunities from um, EU exit. I suppose it's maybe too early to say because we don't know the outcome, but um, we have been putting forward a very strong case, and I suppose the, the, the strength and the evidence that we have that we've been able to develop through the rural policy framework to demonstrate the need to continue to support rural businesses and invest in these communities will help support any argument for future bids going forward. And we're really strong in continuing to do that. And the minister continues to make that point. Okay. And um, and just one hour, I should want to just mention as well, you see under the, uh, the, the connectivity theme, and uh, I should say I was one of the 124 attendees, and John was there too. I remember you in my workshop uh, at Lockery that day in, in January. It was, it was very helpful and very informative. But in the ter under the issue of connectivity, um, we've also mentioned in Gareth's presentation collaborative experiences and all that there. Um, I, I don't see any mention of cooperation. You know, I don't see any mention in this draft for a policy of cooperation measures whereby projects here in, in the north of Ireland could cooperate with similar projects, for example, uh, across Britain or indeed in the south of Ireland. And cooperation w w was a, um, an important aspect of the, the current rural development programme, but I don't see it featuring, and I think it should feature within the connectivity umbrella that's in this draft strategy. So wh wh where, where will cooperation feature, especially now given Brexit and the risk of the North being come and cut off from Britain and indeed the, the rest of the EU. Does, does collaboration and cooperation measures, where, where, where will it feature in the new programme? Maybe, Chair, I'll just dance, you start with that, and maybe Paul might want to come in. But just to say, you know, that uh, we do maintain close contact with colleagues um, in the Republic of Ireland, and more very recently, just in the mid November, 10th of November, I think it was, we, we met with uh, colleagues in the Department of Rural Community and Development to look at opportunities, and there there are a number of leader cooperation projects, but maybe Paul or Gareth might want to comment more detail on that. I'll give Paul the chance first, or do you want me to say something? I suppose maybe, I can, maybe, maybe just one, one thing, um, Declan, on the, um, on the framework. Uh, we, we had a, a two or three what we call horizontal principles, which we applied, and they were really overarching principles which apply right across everything we do in the framework. And one of them is cooperation. Uh, another one was uh, environmental issues. Another one w was equality. But the idea was that um, that will come to the fore when we start developing a program. We, we will take the uh, horizontal principles and we will apply those to the schemes that are coming forward. And that's where you'll see the cooperation coming out. And as Fiona said, we had an extremely good meeting with our colleagues in the South. We have agreed um, to actually set up a little group and, and start looking into some of those schemes. Also, um, I'd like to say that we are working really closely with our colleagues in the South on Peace Plus and everything in Peace Plus is cross-border. Um, and we, we've, uh, we've de developed um, what I think is a, a pretty good um, bid to go into Peace Plus, and it'll be fairly significant, I hope, going down the line. Okay. Um, okay. Um, and just before, before I just move around, one, one last thing, sorry for hugging this, because, but, the, but there's so many questions I'd like to ask. Um, what, what about the leader? You know, obviously it's important that this uh, leader has been a hugely important element of the Rural Development Programme where you had your social partners, your councillors forming lags, identifying local projects relevant to local areas and implementing these. What, 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 how is this new programme going to be rolled out and how is, what's going to be the future of the lags, for example, and how will the leader be incorporated 
to make sure that these projects are rolled out uh, and empowering uh, local communities, social partners to identify these grassroots projects. Chair, I, I'm happy to respond to that, but I'm conscious that Paul has, hasn't had an opportunity to contribute, and I'm not too sure whether he's can, his speakers are working. But maybe just to say that you know we're leaving the EU, so there's no continuation requirements for similar structures to be in place. But that's not to say that we absolutely need to continue to involve our social partners and to make sure that um, decisions and how we inform our local needs and look solutions for that are informed by the people that are close to the ground in that. So whilst we, it's probably too early to say what approach uh, we'll take, we'll, what we'll want to do is make sure that we have the most effective delivery structures. We'll be delivering business cases to make sure that that is uh, taken into account. We'll want to make sure the community planning partnerships are taken into account. But I'd say it's safe to say without full knowledge of how it will be progressed, that we foresee the involvement of local representatives to, to advise and continue to guide on future programme activities. And that bringing decision making very close to the level of those affected by those decisions, I think is very important. Well, that's important, I think, because over the years, and there's probably members in the room who, who were members of LAGS in the past, over the years we've had a really good knowledge and experience base has built up with councillors and social partners getting together and doing that joint work, and it would be important that that knowledge and experience is harnessed, I think, in any future uh, programme for rural areas. Okay, I'm going to move very swiftly around. Uh, Patsy, Patsy Malone. Yes, Jane. I'm a bit heard there, OK, yeah, Go ahead, Patsy. Yep. Yes. Graham, thank you. Um, thanks very much for everybody for coming along today. And I'll, I'll maybe start with Fiona. Uh, Fiona, you're the well-known and, and acknowledged planning professional, so that's where I'm going to start. Um, <laughs> the, uh, one, one of the things, and Fiona knows the area that I'm talking about, um, I, I've just have been listening there, and I'm a wee bit conscious that um, reading through some of the, the thinking that rural equals rural settlements, as in rural villages, and I'm a wee bit, now I'm just putting the marker down, I don't want us to move into the, the territory of rural equals Emmerdale, you know, uh, as in sort of a, as a type of an English mindset that it's just uh, small villages and that's it. As, as any will know, the, the area that I represent, you too, Declan, and many others, it's uh, the real innovation drivers for economic development has come from people living usually on their own farmland, many of whom have diversified and many of whom have become extremely successful. And that's 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 where the sort of area that I represent, and that's where that comes from. Now, um, so therefore, the, the micro-business concept is, is something that will be very, very important to me, and also the drivers for that and the inspirations for that and how they have evolved. So um, I'd just like to put that marker down now. Um, the second thing leading on from that, and this feeds into other stuff, and I'd be interested to hear from the department about the um, about rural planning policies and how they impact upon micro businesses, because that's pretty much a regular event that somebody has a notion or a good idea. They might even have um, the, the good idea advanced to the stage of rural development funding, but the glitch can be um, the the uh, the rural policy which prevents against or is takes as a presumption against uh, development of policy of uh, a business out with the the development area uh, that's assigned to that whether it's a village or a uh, industrial development now um leading on from that and this is the other major things that are the big retardant factors even in those rural settlements and i have to say it has come up twice with me this week already and that is the infrastructure, specifically sewage disposal works capacity. Now, I have, have this thing. Your local development plans have been rolled out by your, your councils, and those a lot of work has been put into them, including in Mid Ulster here by my former colleague yours, Chris Chris Boomer and his staff. However, the lack of capacity of sewage development works has the ability to render significant parts of those local development plans purely academic. Now, that, that's the first wee marker. Uh, it's a bit of a reality check. It has come up twice this week for me already, and that feeds into the sustainability of even the rural settlements or those smaller uh, villages. 
And if you're not, if you don't have people, and if you're not attracting people to live there, well, way goes your schools and your infrastructure and your 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 small pubs or your small shops in the villages. Now, if I could move on, then just basically as well, we're addressing some of this, and I'm glad it's been flagged up. It is an issue, and that's broadband. Now, it also feeds from the economic into into the rural isolation, and the that is that has come to the fore for me more specifically recently with COVID. And I'll explain why, because obviously it'll be the ability to get in touch with friends, family and all that. But it was also for many people, you will know that a key part of their social hub is their church. And many of the churches were doing broadcasts. They, they were doing, uh, well, in our instance, daily mass. In some instances, they, they had rosaries later on in different parts of it. But that's, that's, that's my faith. But the ability or other ways of people to connect with that, particularly some older people, was proven a factor for them. So that connectivity at that level, that aspect of rural isolation is very, very, very important in, in the broadband. But what I would do is maybe ask just as well, if you could bear with me, Chair, and this is an important point, um, the, dealing with and tic tac and with the, the health trusts around issues such as con connectivity, the basic connectivity that many people who are isolated, who are old, who are disabled, is that connectivity with their domiciliary care worker. Now, that is a big, big problem in many of our more isolated rural areas, the ability to deliver that, the ability of trust to get staff to do that. And if if that hasn't been flagged up as an issue with yourselves as part of rural isolation, as part of connectivity, it should have been. And I would like to principally put that marker down that is a big issue in many of our rural areas and increasingly so. Um, it all feeds into connectivity, the isolation, um, people then uh, cut off and, and uh, loneliness. And then the final point here to bear with me is um, that it's good to have a document, it's good to have thinking, it's good to have many stakeholders involved in this, um, but underpinned by funding, uh, have you given any thought to uh, the, uh, we've heard uh, commitments to this and promises of this, but longer term uh, post Brexit funding. So that's that's me, Chair. Thanks very much indeed. Ch Chair, maybe if I um, revert back to my planning <laughs> policy context, you know, in the query that uh, Patsy has raised, I suppose there's a close link between. Um, rural planning policy and development that will be permitted in rural areas. Um, what we want to do is try and ensure that our rural areas are sustainable, that our businesses um, have the opportunity to innovate and that we develop the entrepreneurship that Gareth um, spoke about. And employment is such a key factor, you know, it'll drive the growth and, and that's what we want. We want sustainable rural growth. Um, we want to do it in a way that is sustainable and makes the best use of services um, that are available. And we want to do it in a way that ultimately also protects our environment. So I think working with councils and working with the community planning partners will give us a feel for, for how that can develop. There are issues with um, infrastructure capacity, whether it's broadband or whether it's sewage capacity. Um, and I think that that's something that is a broader piece than DERA. And we need to work with our partners, particularly in DFI, to make sure that they are adhering to rural needs and, yeah. and, and, and addressing that throughout. So I think that's a really important point. I think allowing us to do these pilots is allowing us to test some of those initiatives. And where there are conflicts in the policy, we need to work with partners to try and resolve that or with councils. And I think councils will take... Uh, you know, will have a very close understanding of the issues in their local areas and they will interpret their planning policies according to that. Um, I think in terms of just your point about, and maybe Paul will want to com comment on that in terms of domiciliary care and, and the importance of connectivity, which has never been more importantly recognised, I think, as a result of COVID, where so many people are really 
uh, struggling with that social isolation and and connectivity with families and and all the ways that we use our IT um, and and quite a lot of work has gone on through the Tripsy program to make sure that those issues that rural dwellers are facing um, over the past few months have been tackled. And maybe Paul might want to say something on that. I think Fiona that. Uh... Paul, maybe Sorry, Jack. get in there. Um, hopefully, right. hopefully well, projects I, 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 sort all, of I would say, all I would say, Chair, is that a lot of work has gone on to make sure that there is this access to services, and the department has has managed that in, in as many ways as possible. You know, from forest service helping distribute food to to working with partners and PHA, etc., to make sure that we have uh, the necessary arrangements and support as best possible in place. Right. Um, okay, then. Thank you, Fiona and Patsy. I'm going to ask Rosemary here to come in. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation again. Thank you. Um, I'm a bit like Pansy. I'm going back into the planning policy. I want to ask you a wee bit about planning. And this is this is in relation to perhaps somebody that's been left a rural farm, um, no buildings on it whatsoever, and there seems to be a huge gap in the sense that they cannot build a shed until they have been proving that they've been an active farmer for six years. What work have you what what work have you done with the planning? What work have you done with the planning policy branch in relation to trying to get that resolved, those type of issues? Well, Chair, um, as, I'm, I'm, as I'm left, uh, I, I formerly was involved in planning, but I suppose it's been a, a number of years since uh, I have uh, let, since I worked with the Department for Infrastructure. But I understand the issues that you're you're referring to, and I understand the issues and the restrictions that apply to development in rural areas, and uh, and the reasoning for that, as I said. Earlier, I think that uh, local councils now, whilst they have those planning powers, they can attach judgment to the particular circumstances of each case. And we would want to make sure that our local planning authorities um, adhere to, you know, that, that's the kind of the principle of, of planning powers uh, with local councils, that they have the powers to understand and that decision making is very close to their local level. I think where there's a, if there's a feeling that there's planning policy um, that is needs to be reviewed in order to support what we're trying to achieve in rural development, I think that's a conversation that we need to have with Department for Infrastructure as the developers of the policy, but also with the local councils who have been very involved in, in this uh, policy framework, taking it forward. Um, and uh, I'm not too sure whether Gareth is aware that this issue has come up by the local uh, council representatives, but maybe Gareth might want to comment on that. <clears throat> uh, sorry, through the chair. Yeah, there, I mean, there, there has always been an issue around planning and particularly the funding through leader and particularly actually uh, a bit like you highlighted there particularly when it's looking at uh, micro businesses that want to develop on farm there's always been a bit of a clash there um, one of the things we did in the past we, we didn't do it in this program but we did it in the previous one was we actually set up a small um, group between ourselves and the planners and what we uh, what we were able to do is we were actually we met probably about once a month and we were able to sit down and look at individual issues um, and actually individual projects and certainly I found that uh, to be a great help because what was happening with us at one stage we had I think it was something like three million committed to projects that were all stuck in planning and I don't think I'm not being critical, but I don't think sometimes on the ground the planners realised the impact it was having further behind because that three million was actually then tied up and committed, and we could do nothing else with it. So um, something I've been looking at actually, believe it or not, in the last couple of days is setting something similar to that up, and I was going to have a conversation with um, Fiona about it, given her knowledge of the planners. Um, but I think certainly going into a new program, it would be something worthwhile and something worth doing. Yes, it would be something worth doing. I think it's something, you know, 
we want to, we want to see our rural areas become alive again. And if a person can't get plan and permission for a, a farm shed to prove that they're an active farmer, it's it's a great hindrance to to that. <laughs> um, second thing I want to want to look at again is broadband and project stratum. Uh, have you had? Have you fed much in the project stratum to try and support them at looking where rural broadband is, is going to go in the countryside? Because we've just we heard just through the in through through the chamber the other day where in Fermanagh South Tyrone there were certain areas recommended recommended for broadband, and I understand approximately three to four hundred of them have been pulled out of the project. Three to four hundred homes, that is, and those are the most isolated. And we need to be yeah. getting the broadband out there. Yeah, I'm sorry, if you, know, if you, do you want me to say something quickly? I'm sorry, to yeah, please. Um, Thanks, guys. So, I actually sit on the project board, um, and the the the, the department. Um, is a, a partner with the Department for Economy. We're a partner to the, to the level of um, 15 million pounds. We, we had, <clears throat> I sat on the project board long before um, we ever decided to put money in, but the minister uh, looked, at, looked at how much money was going in, looked to see what an additional 15 million could do and how further that could penetrate into rural areas. So that's why that funding has gone in there. Um, as regards the, the priority of how that is actually rolled out, that that really comes down to a technical design with the company. Um, and certainly as a project board, we don't really have a lot of input as to who gets it first, who gets it second. Um, the, the, the company, and I suppose as a member of the project board, I'd agree with them, that the idea is to use the best methodology to make the best use of the money available. So the, the, the more people you can actually connect, the better. And whatever methodology is used to do that, the end game has to be to close the gap completely. And um, I think this project will leave very, very little. And I think as, as you see it roll out, you will actually see um, possibly the number of premises that are going to be targeted going up as opposed to going down. You're, you do believe that the most isolated premises that cannot get broadband will now get it after this project has been ruled out? The, uh, there, there will be very, very few premises left. I mean, we're talking certainly four figures or less. Right, OK. And the last question. You, it, through the rural programme, you've always given money towards new projects, new innovative projects, and rightly so. I don't, dis don't disagree with that. But... Throughout in the Western, in the West, we have a number of projects that are maybe have been on the go for 20 years and they're old, they're tired, they need money put in to revitalise them. There doesn't seem to be as much money for revitalising some of the projects that are already there. New projects are fine, but some of the old ones need a wee bit of a lift to get them going again. Has consideration been given to that? Sorry. Sorry, Fiona, I can, I can take that one probably again. Or, or Paul, can you get in yet? Or <coughs> No. Um, sorry, I, I take it wrong from you, mean um, the likes of community projects? Yes, uh-huh. Yeah, that is, that is something that actually came out of the working groups very strongly, um, was the fact, and I, I, I tried to allude, and I'm sorry if I steamrolled my way through the, the presentation, but I knew there was a lot to get through, but... Um, one of the things that came out of that working group was the fact that over the years we have heavily invested in new premises and new community infrastructure, but a lot of the older community infrastructure has been left behind. So that um, that will be one of the key focuses um, of the program going forward, and we may we may well look in the interim at doing some sort of a pilot to actually test the assumptions coming out of that. And if we do that, that will be sooner rather than later. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rosemary, John. Sure, thank you. And th thanks, Paul, Gareth and Fiona for the information this morning and also for the thank you again for the, lo the lottery experience we had 
um, uh, uh, at the time you referred to, and this is my time for a plug to say that it um, be very good to repeat that experience. And of course, there's a, a lovely facility called Greenmount in, in my constituency that you might want to you might want to come to next time. Um, uh, so some of the, the questions I had around planning have been covered already, but I'm going to, going to try and ask more strategically. While, whilst I welcome the, the focus on issues around connectivity and also innovation and entrepreneurship, I'm very keen to know if this interdepartmental approach, which has been applied through working groups and the project board, um, will be carried through, and if there's a commitment from other departments to uh, continue to work with that, and I'm asking for this reason. Um, we know there are issues around planning. I, I've raised previously things like agritourism that is not quite the thing in this region that it is in other places. I know that if someone opens a smaller microbrewery in a rural area, they can't sell their own product, but the pub down the road can sell it, except they might be closed for lengthy periods at holiday times, which are vital to tourism. And there's an interdepartmental link, link there also. There's most certainly an issue around planning for farms doing different things on their premises if, if they choose to do that. So, in short, is that interdepartmental commitment committed to in the medium to long term, on top of the work being done at project board level and, and other working groups at this point? Maybe, uh, thank you, Chair. I would just say that um, I think that there's a need for us to work across departments for those types of issues, absolutely. Um, in terms of the tourism projects that you talked about at a strategic level, um, I participated in um, the Minister Dodds led tourism recovery group and Paul has, uh, participates as a member of the TNI led working group. I, I also have brought together a group of our interests within DERA to look at tourism because we have issues like forestry, country parks, equine, angling, all of that, you know, so to make sure that we bring that integration together. But it's also really important that we do that uh, work with other departments, particularly if there is a policy, be it a planning policy or whatever the policy or approach might be that is impacting on what we are trying to achieve. Um, and as I say, as Gareth has said, you know, that, that working group or, um, in relation to planning partners, um, it seems as if it will provide an opportunity for us to address some of the issues that are being referred to, but it's really important that we are able to work together collaboratively to achieve the outcomes that we want to achieve from this new policy. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hey, John. Thank you for that. Um, all right. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, Fiona, Gareth and Paul. Um, I suppose I could start out by saying Gareth's never a good idea to rush a man from Donegal, but however, <laughs> we'll try anyway. Uh, um, just a few wee things. Diversification of rural businesses and um, the pilot schemes and narrowing it down as much as we can here and agri-food projects. I've noticed lately um, a few farms are doing local sales of fresh milk and that seems to be a new project. Um, I was just wondering if you had any conversations with anything like that, because to me that seems like a really good idea and it could develop on to, set, to, to sell um, other produce as well. Thank you. Maybe, Gareth, do you want to mention that in terms of what future issues we might um, yeah. explore? Um, I suppose j just to say, hi. I mean, the, the food scheme we're looking at is for is primarily targeted at micro food businesses that want to shift up to the next level. So where you maybe have um, a small bakery producing scones for the two local garages, and all of a sudden, uh, Spar has come along and said, "We hear you've got great scones. We'd like to sell them in all our spars." Um, that that's the kind of um, business that we'd like to target and also a key part of that scheme is that at least 50% of the ingredients to any product must come from Northern Ireland and again that's key because we want to support our, support our farmers uh, um, and, and anybody else who can produce an input to the food. On the diversification side um, we've always looked at diversification as um, a rural business and 
many years ago, we kind of took the decision that we'd stop calling businesses, rural businesses and diversified businesses and just call them businesses, rural businesses. Um, and certainly in the uh, pilot scheme that we've, we have uh, launched there, out of the 27, there are a number of um, what you would call diversified businesses um, that are included in that. But I think that the, the key thing um, when it comes down to funding business at the minute is we, we are trying to go beyond what um, economists would call mature markets. So where you have a, a, a business that would be fairly common, um, we, we are trying to avoid providing funding for those because you get into issues about displacement and we are looking for those new innovative businesses that, that somebody uh, hasn't really taken forward before. Um, the fresh milk one's an interesting one. And uh, I know certainly on another scheme that was run under our Tripsy program, there have been a couple of people have applied into that for grant aid for the, the, the vending machines. Um, and I think that I think only time will tell um, how, how well those projects will, will roll out. But I think it is very much a case of having the right location. Um, and I, I won't be surprised if we see a number of farm shops installing milk vending machines. Um, I think that that would suit very well. That's very good. Thank you very much. I mean, if they've applied on their trips or whatever or shown interest, that's very good. And I mean, I'll just finish by saying that hopefully Stratum will help the broadband for all it's certainly looking to. So hopefully it helps enough and even indeed all. So thank you. Thank you, Chair. Perfect. Thank you, Harry. And um, Gareth. Uh, Morris? Can you hear me there, Morris? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yeah, go, Morris, loud and clear. I'm moving around this office like a, like a, like a butterfly in a flower garden to try and get a good... Uh, and I'm in the middle of Korean and I have no broadband, so I don't know what that means for the rest of the country. For you, Chair, I can pick up on a couple of things, and that's the, uh, the social enterprise strategy ensuring that rural hubs are financially sustainable uh, and the grants the grants are good to enhance or fund startups but often in my experience the grant fin once the grant finance ends sustainability is hard to maintain uh, and the other point i would pick up on is something that gareth and, and uh, said and fiona had alluded to in response to patsy and rosemary uh, and that's around the diversification of rural business to ensure the innovation uh, and encourage startups I think there's a great difficulty within the planning process. The problem with, plan, plan, the problem with planning across all 10 council areas uh, is, there, is, the interpretation, is the interpretation of, of planning policy. Uh, there seems to be no clear policy on rural uh, interpretations. Will the department be engaging with the Department of Infrastructure uh, to relax planning policies and allow rural businesses to grow? Okay, maybe I, I'll, I'll go back to the, the planning uh, response, um, first of all, um, and just to say I think that uh, working group that Gareth has uh, mentioned in terms of working with plan partners would be really helpful in terms of trying to understand what some of the responses the issues that are given rise to and, and whether there's uh, an interpretation of policy that um, can be looked at uh, to try and see how it matches what we are trying to achieve as well. Um, the plan of powers are being interpreted by the local councils and, and the local planning officers in the councils um, should have the awareness of the issues that are facing their local area and, and be able to apply the policy accordingly. I think in terms of you know the point in relation to social enterprise and providing grants um, is one point, and I think Gareth alluded to this earlier. It you know we need to try and make sure that we build resilience into this and that we build capacity and capability within our rural communities, and that that's part of what we're trying to achieve as well going forward. That it's not just a one-off grant that is provided; that there is. Uh, a, rec a recognition through the process that we need to that allows for us to build capacity and capability and whether that's training or whatever is part of the process um mm -hmm. we're, tr we're trying to take that into account as well sorry okay. chair, chair just just to add to that morris and um, one of one of the things that we are looking at we, we recognize exactly what you're saying about business startups so one of the things we're looking at doing going forward is putting in place a program which would be very similar to the farm business development groups, except it would be micro business development groups, 
we actually bring people together um, as, a, as a network and you, you teach them some basic skills about business, things like how do you do your accounts, how do you actually get supply chains in place, albeit even if it's a small local supply chain, and basically um, and take them away and mentor them through how to be a business person. And that, that would be a program we would hope to be um, working into the, the new overarching program, that, that particular scheme, sorry, into the, the overarching uh, program going forward. Yeah, yeah. thanks for that, Gareth. I, I would be keen to see, uh, see farm business uh, expand because I think the farmer would get more uh, pounds, I think, for his produce, selling himself direct and bypassing the, the, the shops. But we are where we are. Thanks, Gareth. Thank you, Fiona. Okay, Morris. Um, Thank you, Claire. Uh, Claire, Claire, are you there? Are you thanks, Chair, um, and thanks for the um, presentation as well. I just wanted to just ask, the pilot scheme that we have started, how long is it, is it planned that they will run? Gareth, maybe you could give an update yeah. on, on where we are with each, with, each, with each of the four at the moment. Um, there's yeah. one currently open, but Gareth, maybe if you just yeah. give the date. I mean, the, the, the four that we have launched, um, the micro business growth scheme, all the applications are in, and those hopefully will be assessed before Christmas and letters of offer out. The uh, web business, uh, the web business development scheme, which is targeted tourism, um, those applications are all in with Tourism NI and those are being assessed. And again, they plan to have all letters of offer out before the end of March. Um, the social, the uh, rural social uh, enterprise investment scheme um, closes on the 11th of December. And our target is to have those processed and letters of offer out by the start of February. And the experiential tourism um, scheme, the applications are in. We haven't had, as they're, they're from councils, we haven't had as many applications as we thought. So, again, uh, we would hope to have those processed um, out the door by January. And already, I suppose the, the, the key factor, I went back uh, to what I said earlier, one was to, to bridge the gap in funding, one was to get money out uh, on the back of COVID. And the other was to test assumptions, and we've already learned things from the growth scheme. Uh, we tested a few different uh, a few different ways of processing, which we haven't done before. Um, in the growth scheme as well, we've always been criticised for red tape and the amount of red tape we we bind ourselves in. So we actually had a significant reduction in red tape in that scheme, and that now seems to be working, and people seem to be able to get through the process here uh, easier. So we we are um, we are feeding the uh, some of the results of of those schemes, even though letters of offer aren't out. I mean, I, I know, for instance, on the growth scheme, I can think of four uh, distinct findings that we have had already, which we would apply to a future program going forward. Okay, so there's been a number of schemes up and running, and you're expecting then that um, all, or if not, then the most of them. Um, we'll get their letters of office offer and be long term projects then sustained after that. Um, maybe then ask so the, the, the planning and the development of this framework started two years ago, was that right? It started in November uh, 2019, 2018, sorry. Yep, okay, 2018. So, uh, and now, um, I know from an answer from the minister that the um, consultation was due to go out back in the autumn of this year. Um, can you just let me know then? So we've started the pilot projects. It's obviously well developed. Um, but when's the consultation going to happen? When's the buy-in? When's the sign-off? And when are we going to see the actual finished document? Well, maybe, Chair, if I take that. Um, and thank you, Claire, for that question. I think we have... I suppose that what I would say is we've taken an awful lot of consultation through this exercise. So we've engaged extensively with stakeholders, I think, as Gareth has pointed out throughout this. So we don't see it as a point of view, you know, we've done all of this framework and now we're going out to consult. We've tried to do it as a continuum throughout the whole process. And, um, and as such, we'd be fairly hopeful by the time we go out to consultation that there will be quite a bit of buy-in to that. 
we had hoped to go out in the autumn and the ministers previously said that and it's keen for us to get this out to formal public consultation but the impact of COVID I suppose has delayed that to some extent and, and what we did was prioritise our resources and trying to get funding out in the ground to our local communities and to our rural businesses just to help them you know, be sustained throughout this prolonged period of time. We hope now that we have had the opportunity to have the findings from the pilots. We're going to build that in to our final framework. So our final framework, we have the document drafted. We're trying to just tinker it and either influence some of the findings from the pilot and we hope to have it launched early in the next year uh, early in the next year as a result of COVID we probably will uh, do a consultation online and not have the consultation that was previously referred to in, in Lockery or in Greenmouth both, both of which facilities we use a lot but uh, it'll probably be early in the new year by a citizen space uh, for an eight week consultation period Okay, Grant, and just then quickly, how many actual pilot schemes have been approved and are up and running at the minute? Four. Four. Okay, thank you. Okay. Hey, thank you, Pat, uh, Claire, and Fiona. Um, William? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your presentation. Um, for me, I think it's important that we encourage people to stay in the, the, the local areas, uh, and that's you know, the difficulty you have, you have young people maybe, no broadband, a number of different issues on the move uh, away from the countryside. Uh, I think it's important there's help for farmers and small farmers especially to diversify and there's capacity to encourage them and help them to apply for funding. I think that's, that's important. Uh, the issue of plan has been covered. Uh, I mean, for me, I mean, we all, many of us thought Planning going to local councils would have made things easier. The opposite has actually been the case. Um, and there was red tape around some rural development. <laughs> There's a lot more around planning at the moment, I believe. So uh, we're dealing with planners, I'm dealing with planners on a daily basis, and there's a lot of issues there. Um, I think it's important that there's a joined up approach or uh, work across departments. Uh, I think. The Department of Agriculture needs to, needs to work with the uh, local councils and bring up a, a policy that is deliverable and that is easy accessible to uh, the farming community, especially the small farm. Um, maybe I could ask a couple of wee questions. One in relation to is there a need for more community support to help support. deliver the objectives in the countryside? And maybe to Gareth, the microfood investment scheme that he said is going to be um, delivered, could he give us a bit more information in relation to that? I can do, I'll do, Phil and I can do the, the microfood one first. Um, we hope to launch that in January, but we're hoping to do a soft launch in December. So what we will be doing is that the minister will uh, do a soft launch of the scheme and there'll be information available to potential applicants, hopefully from um, the start of December, uh, right through December, so that people have the opportunity to actually read what's on offer, whether it suits them. So that when the scheme opens in, in January, they're not starting from scratch, that they have a, a reasonable idea of what they're actually uh, might want to apply for. Okay. Okay. I, and just in terms of you know working uh, cr cross departmentally with DFI um, planners and with uh, the planners in local government, we're happy to take that away. And Gareth has referred to you know the suggestion that we just build up that working group again and and make sure that there's a clear understanding that the objectives that we're trying to achieve and the outcomes that we're trying to achieve are being supported um, and understood by people that are working within uh, local government and within Department for Infrastructure. Yeah, well, I think local councils are looking at their plan policy in the coming months. So I think that's important that, that you should feed into that too. I think it's very important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Fiona and uh, William as well. Um, um, uh, Claire had asked the question I did want clarity on uh, when does it open for public consultation? So you're telling us early in the new year this will be open for public consultation. Um, uh, and that's that's good because um, um, that, that that's good because it's important that local uh, community 
groups and the sectors and wider public have their, their say in making sure this has got right. Um, there's a big issue to do with planning. I think also that there's DFA is a huge stakeholder that DERA needs to, enter, needs to work with, but also the, each council's local development plan as well. Each council's local development plan uh, needs to be um, supportive also of um, the, this, this rural policy in terms of moving forward with, um, with business or local business development around areas. And I know as a former councillor and current MLA that quite often you find a contradictory situation whereby on one hand maybe the, the DERA may be um, supporting the funding application for a micro-business or a foreign diversification grant. So one branch of government is supporting it, and then in our branch of government planning, uh, uh, there's a presumption against uh, economic development in the countryside. So that's something that needs to be got right if it's not going to impede the implementation of this rural policy, which, of course, we all want to see uh, rolled out and to benefit. So, um, so I want to thank you very much for your coming on today, um, Gareth and Paul and Fiona. We're going to move on now. We have some witnesses coming in from representing the rural sector. So I want to thank you very, very much for attending here today and for giving very comprehensive briefing and very comprehensive answers to our questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chair and members. Okay. Okay, so we are moving on now to. Um, hang on. Let me find where I am first. Okay, we're going to have an oral uh, evidence session now from the Rural Community Network, Rural Action, and the NA uh, Rural Women's Network uh, on the future rural affairs policy. I'd like to welcome by uh, Starleaf. Louise Coy, the director of the NA Rural Women's Network, Aidan Campbell, policy officer of uh, Rural Community Network, and Teresa Canavan, CEO of uh, Rural Action. And I'd like to ask uh, the representatives to uh, commence their briefing and then we'll ask some questions uh, whenever you are finished up. So you're very welcome, Louise, Aidan, and Teresa. If you want to kick off there, whoever wants to go first, you can agree amongst yourselves. I think Teresa, Teresa, you're going to kick off. You, you hear? Are you in yeah. with your sound? Yeah. Grand. Teresa, do you want okay. to kick off? Thank, there? thank you, Chair. Can you hear? Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, thank you, Chair and Committee, um, for the invite today. Yes, I'm talking, Aidan. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Teresa, we can hear you perfectly. Oh, okay, Aidan okay. must be having a difficulty. Um, look, thank you, Chair and Committee, for the um, invite today. Go ahead, Teresa. Go ahead, Teresa. Um, okay. Better to go ahead. Just keep going. Teresa, okay, there's a bit of an echo. I sorry, I, I just I'm hearing myself coming back. Uh, we, we, well, well. We're not picking up the echo, Teresa. Um, um, it's probably very disorientating for yourself. Uh, is there something that we need to hear to turn something off or other? Um, we can hear you 100%, Teresa, anyway. Okay, well, I'll just keep talking then. Do you want to see if any, anybody else can step in? Uh, Louise or mm -hmm. Aidan, can you pick it up there um, mm -hmm. uh, until Teresa yeah. gets sorted out? Or? Yeah, well, if you want, um, can you can you hear me all right, um, yeah. Chair? Yeah, we can hear you, yeah. You're a bit, your photograph's a bit pixely, but yeah. we can hear um, you all right. <laughs> um, I'm on a very bad broadband connection here um, at home, so you just have to, uh, hopefully you'll be able to hear me. Um, 100%. And Teresa obviously is having difficulty. As well with Starleaf, I'm getting unstable network connection here, so um, you just bear with me a minute. Um, I suppose, first of all, Teresa's going to do the introduction, but maybe I'll pick up with it and just first of all to thank the committee for the invite um, and to say that we're just responding, I suppose, to what DERA, DERA officials have just said. So our points will be general reactions or comments and then some general principles on how we see future rural development policy. And then it may be more useful just to open up the questions and answers or a general discussion. 
uh, if the technology holds out. Um, I suppose the other thing to say is that we were all involved, our three organisations in subgroups in the co-production process. Um, rural Action and Rural Community Network co-facilitated the engagement day in Lockery in January. I think we were talking to a couple of uh, members of the committee, three or four members of the committee were at that day. I think it was a, it was a good discussion, a fruitful discussion. Um, and we did, I suppose, have a discussion on some of these issues previously with the committee on the 14th of February this year at an evidence session um, that you were taking on the Agriculture Bill, UK Agriculture Bill. Um, so a couple of points maybe from me, and then uh, Teresa was going to make a couple of points, but if I'll, I'll make a couple of points and then maybe hand over to Louise, and by that stage maybe um, Teresa's connection will come back in. So in the previous programme, there were lots of groups, I suppose, ruled themselves out um, of the Rural Development Programme due to the need for match funding, needing to be a company limited by guarantee, or needing to put in their own resources at risk. So from our point of view, and from, I suppose, grassroots groups' point of view, I think in this scheme, or whatever schemes are being developed out of our rural development, new rural development policy framework, we need to ensure that those new schemes are as user-friendly as they can be. And we need to build skills and confidence of groups to apply and simplify the application processes as much as we can. Otherwise, there's a risk that funding is going to go to the groups who have drawn down RDP in previous programs, who have attained a certain level of expertise. And those other groups then that haven't been part of those processes will get left further behind because they still won't feel as if this is a program that they can apply to. We'd also be keen that any new program is on a multi-year budget so officials and communities can plan rural development in a more strategic way. A key question for rural stakeholders, I suppose, is where will the budget come from and what will the timeline be? Um, I suppose we can have a really good um, co-produced rural development policy framework um, with great ideas about innovative programs and schemes, but if there's no money there to fund it or very little money to fund it, then there's going to be difficulties. So uh, the UK Shared Prosperity Fund was referred to by the Chancellor yesterday in the spent review announcement, and I suppose that's where we've been led to believe the vast majority of rural development funding is going to come um, as a replacement to EU funding. Um, the spent review yesterday announced in 21-22 there are proposed to be pilot programmes, UK Shared Prosperity Fund pilot programmes across the UK to the tune of £220 million. But really, there wasn't a whole lot more detail in the spent review, and there is more detail is going to be made available in the spring. But it looks like the full programme won't be in place until April 2022. So there's a legitimate fear of a gap in funding at a difficult time, as the economy deals with the pandemic impacts, plus the end of the Brexit transition. So from a rural perspective, we believe it's important that the UK Shared Prosperity Fund includes a ring fence pot for rural development as it's a fund that potentially is covering a lot of different priorities, and our fear is that rural development funding could get lost in it. The last RDP had a substantial funding commitment from our own executive funds, um, and hopefully our own executive will be uh, able to step up to that um, in, the, in the new policy, rural policy development framework. But I would say there's an expectation that has been created in the public mind um, and stakeholders' mind that any replacement funding for EU structural fund programmes will be at at least the same level as in the previous program. Um, and that's all the, the comments I was going to make. And I'm going to hand over maybe to Louise now, um, and hopefully we'll be able to go back to Teresa at the end. So Louise, do you want to jump in there? Yeah, good morning, everybody. And thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you all um, this morning. Um, I suppose Declan raised one of the issues that, that I had already this morning, and that's the need to retain that principle of community-led de local development, that local input from local communities into spending decisions, but also into all the program design and evaluation as we go ahead. And um, whatever structures need to emerge, I feel needs to take um, women's involvement and rep representation seriously. We have had numerous um, 
rural development programs, successive programs that all have highlighted that there's an issue with targeting women as part of the program. And this new program being indigenous to ourselves is an opportunity to redress that. And I would say, I mean, obviously women is, rural women is, is my area, but I would say the same is true for young people have, have consistently been a target um, group. And by target group, you will all know that actually they haven't really been targeted. They're called a target group, as in they're underrepresented as part of uh, beneficiaries of the program. And we need to make sure that um, how we go ahead with a new program doesn't exclude um, rural women and young people. Um, again, Declan had raised this a bit and, and Aidan has touched on it, but the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, um, all <laughs> new structural funds did have a cross-border element and we need to ensure that that's retained when it comes back from Westminster and um, that they've taken account of that cross-border learning. Um, DERA, I think, needs to consider which other stakeholders we need around the table when they're doing co-production and not just DERA, actually as MLS I would appeal to all of you that across all the different um, programs that are happening um, as a stakeholder we hear a lot about co-production and co-design and um, it is my experience that that how that happens varies greatly from program not just from program to program and not just from department to department and I think there needs to be a more cohesive and transparent process for co-production and co-design. Um, I think it's going to be very important when you get to a detailed scheme to hear from a diverse range of voices and experiences. And I know there was some start to the program. Um, you know, it was great to have a huge room full of people in Lockery, and it was a huge room, and, and it, there was quite a bit of diversity there. But I'm not sure that's how it started out. I know, I know probably officials agree disagree with me on that, but although we were on those stakeholder groups, um, we had to ask for a space on that. We were not included, and yet, you know, women are a target group. We're the only uh, regional organization with a remit for rural women, and we didn't automatically get an invite. And really, when co-design is happening, th those things need to be looked at. Um, and I think if equality is going to be a cross-cutting horizontal principle, of the program going ahead it needs to be built in from the very very beginning and my concern with the equality principles is always that when there's pressure for spend when there's pressure for delivery when there's pressure to meet targets it's the thing that drops off all the time we're seeing that with the current program we have a monitoring committee meeting scheduled for tomorrow and um, the first in, in a very long time that we've had an actual meeting and we know with, we're living in a pandemic and it's been difficult times but they have not had the equality and good relations subgroup meeting in advance of that which is the practice and it hasn't happened there's going to be i've been told there's going to be no figures in regard to the equality monitoring of this program available for tomorrow and i just i suppose i'm just putting out there that i think we need to learn from the past and how things have been done if we're moving into the future and, and to do things better. And I think we always need to be doing things better. And I know Fiona is a gender champion and I'm hoping that that's going to, to make a difference as well, um, hopefully for women's engagement on the program. Um, we know that um, future rural policy framework will be developed in the coming months, but I suppose I would appeal to the committee um, that our citizens and, and members are concerned about that immediate gap come the 1st of January 21. We need to know how the department and the executive are going to be communicating with citizens about what the immediate impacts are likely to be. I would like to know, you know, what um, scenario planning has been done within the department um, and within the executive on what those potential outcomes could be on day one of our transition, you know, exit from the EU. Maybe day one is not the day we need to worry about. Maybe it's maybe two months in when things start to really pile up. I don't know, but I would like to be able to support our membership. And I know um, Aidan and Teresa are the same. In order to help the citizens that, that we deliver for, um, we need the information and we need the support. And I think there will probably need to be some resourcing and funding um, from the executive in order to deal with that. Um, I know it's very difficult and it probably is a scenario plan and issue whenever, you know, things are not still not settled this far into, into the transition period. 
Um, but people still need guidance about how that end of that period is going to affect them in five weeks' time. So that would be my appeal to you on that, which I know is not directly linked to this programme, but it is linked directly to our rural citizens. And I suppose this is our opportunity to raise it with you as, as a committee. So that's me. I hope Teresa is... Um, I think so, Louise. I think I've managed to solve the problem. So um, sorry about that, folks. I'm not sure what happened there, but um, thanks very much to the chair and committee for the invite today. Um, I'm not sure how much maybe Aidan had said um, when I couldn't hear, but um, just to, to re reiterate um, a few points in relation to the future rural development policy. And I suppose just to start by saying we note the references to broadband this morning. Um, and on that note, we'd just like to... Um, Acknowledge, I suppose, the recent announcement relating to the Rural Broadband Project and the commencement of works. Um, the current pandemic um, has, in many ways, highlighted the importance of good connectivity and the very real challenges and difficulties in areas where there's poor coverage. Um, so we're pleased to hear about the progress um, on the project. Um, I suppose just to echo members' comments, um, that it's very important that it reaches those um, most in need. Um, also, I suppose just to say that from the outset that the comments that members have made, I think um, we'd be fully supportive of everything that was mentioned there in relation to planning, sustaining communities, farm diversification, cooperation and leader. Um, so I don't want to, to, to go over um, everything that maybe has been said previously. Um, but I suppose it's just important to acknowledge that the um, process keeps moving. Um, we look forward to an inclusive consultation process um, so that we can provide some longevity to the Rural Development Programme and move away from short-term or annual budgets. Uh, I think it's important that we use the time now to support communities and businesses to become investment ready. Um, we believe that the proposed themes um, provide scope to meet the current and emerging needs and we'd wish to ensure flexibility is maintained uh, to adapt and develop priorities based on need at any particular time. I suppose we'd also like to see less restrictions on capital and revenue allocations and welcome the opportunity to test and learn from pilots and new innovative approaches and would suggest that this will require a review on how we assess risk um, with innovation. Uh, obviously, there becomes, you know, you have to take a leap of faith. So we do need to consider um, our attitude to risk and be prepared to try um, new approaches. Um, I suppose just to touch base again on that point about groups being ready for the investment, I think... Um, we have time now between the policy being developed um, that we could, we, we need to address some of the challenges that communities face in getting shovel ready or investment ready. Uh, and we'd be keen to ensure that what, we use whatever time we have between now and seeing a fully resourced policy and programme to support rural groups, communities and businesses to be ready. And that will require investment in project animation and development support. Uh, at the early stage of the pandemic, we saw a huge volunteer effort across a wide range of grassroots community organisations and how they responded to the immediate hardship. So I suppose we want to look at how we can develop programmes to harness and enhance that and what we can learn from this immediate response and how we do we address some of the challenges and indeed opportunities that will arise out of this. Um, in that regard, we're looking forward to working with the department um, and responding to the DERA consultation and putting forward ideas for future programmes and schemes within the context of priorities outlined. I think Aidan maybe mentioned at the outset um, both ourselves and, and RCN had a role in the um, engagement day and, and, and in supporting the workshop. So we're very supportive of the broad thrust um, of the framework um, and just you know, obviously want to see it now coming into fruition. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa, Louise, and Aidan for uh, for attending and, and giving that very uh, good presentation. Um, before I just uh, move around the room, I suppose uh, just uh, by way of of, of asking for even for your three groups, you know, uh, just to give us a sense, what what in your views would be the most salient, important um, element that you'd like to see off a, a future program? What, what what would you see as the most important? Uh, overarching element you'd like to see included in a future program. Will I start? Yeah. yeah Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I suppose. I mean, the, the framework is designed to look at social, economic and environmental aspects. And I think um, there's important aspects of all of that. Um, I think employability, um, particularly for our young people um, moving forward um, out of the, the uh, pandemic will be something that we need to consider. Um, how can we um, create rural areas that are sustainable and attractive um, to, to rural young people? Um, certainly the whole health and well-being 
um, social social development. Um, so I think there's there's aspects, um, I suppose, Declan, of all of the strands that we need to take forward if we're going to have thriving, sustainable rural communities. Um, but certainly um, the employment strand, uh, working with young people, is something that we would be very keen to, to look at. Um, also community infrastructure um, and supporting um, the very valuable work that, that volunteers do on the ground. Um, so there's, there's quite a, I suppose, a long list that, um, that we would be looking to take forward out of the, the strategy. Thank you. Louise or Edna, is there anything you want to add to that? Or? Um, I'll maybe come in. I know Aidan is having some issues with his broadband. I think he can hear there, though. So um, I suppose I, I agree with everything that Teresa said. It's about how do we ensure that people can continue to live and work and thrive in our in our rural communities. And I, I think the, the the current themes are a very good start to that. And they are all interlinked. You know, you mm. can't um, have really great community spaces you can't have really great businesses without the rural broadband you know but it is about i suppose for us a priority is about that sustaining the community infrastructure that is so important um to rural people and rural communities um we probably have quite a lot of buildings and things like that but how, how are those um building staffed and, and hire people supported to be delivering service in, in those community hubs that we have um across rural Northern Ireland. Um I know some areas maybe do need um some capital build, but by and large we're doing pretty well in terms of actual physical spaces. Um but it's about the, the long term, I suppose Rosemary touched on that, the long term maintenance and investment in those things that are already working. Um we would like to see that. I mean, I think that what COVID did shine a light on was that all of the difficulties that we may experience in rural areas, such as our broadband, are highlighted. Issues such as poverty were highlighted. Those things that we all knew, but actually one of the, the biggest ways to address that, government needed the local groups in order to deliver um, their funding and support um, to alleviate um, COVID-19. So I suppose it's about maintaining and retaining. That would be my biggest priority. And I suppose being ambitious for the future um, that our young people do have jobs, that our young people want to, to stay and live and grow in the, in the areas um, that they're from. Thank you very much, Louise. Um, I'm going to move around. Uh, Claire? Claire? Can you hear me? Claire Bailey? Okay. Okay, well, uh, we'll get Claire in a wee minute. John, you're next to us. Uh, th to thank you, Chuck. Can I thank uh, Theresa and Louise and, and Aidan as well and say that it's, it's good to see them again? Um, you, you may have heard me earlier at, at the departmental uh, presentation asking about. Uh, an inter interdepartmental approach and, and whether or not that could be sustained as plans develop around rural provision. But more specifically on that interdepartmental issue for yourselves, can I ask you, for example, if the visibility of a cross departmental approach is necessary to yourselves? For example, do you see uh, visibility from arm's length bodies from other departments? We, we assume. The Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs has a very significant rural role, and that is correct. But I'm keen to know how much you see of other departments and the agencies, for example, the Arts Council or Sport NI. Are they delivering through the rural network, and is there visibility of those organisations um, at, at local rural level? And also on the subject of diversity, I'm keen to know does the Executive Office Community Relations budget extend to, which in my opinion, by the way, is very often targeted to two communities, not all communities, but um, does that, uh, do, does, do, do programmes uh, organised by, by that, that branch of the Executive Office, do they reach rural communities? I'm keen to see diversity uh, approached and, and addressed in rural areas as well. We know that uh, representative groups are very often based in Belfast and Derry. But I'm keen to know that um, how we address the need of our uh, minority communities, people from different ethnic backgrounds, the LGBT community, and others in the rural area. I'm very keen to hear your your feedback on that. Maybe if I can start on that um, diversity question, 
Um, and I know if Aidan was able to join us, he would be able to um, articulate better the work that the Rural Community Network does with the Community Relations Council um, and Charmaine, um, you know, in terms of, of good relations and community relations um, across rural Northern Ireland. Um, I suppose there was mention this morning of the, the Peace Plus programme um, and you know, with the exception of more recent um, peace programs, there's always been a dedicated focus on rural peace and reconciliation and cross-border relations in the form of a rural intermediary funding body. And I suppose I feel that um, rural communities have in some way lost out um, not having that strategic or dedicated pot of funding in more recent programs. So I think it was encouraging to hear the department talking about their engagement again with the Peace Plus program. Um, and hopefully that will encourage a greater diversity um, within rural areas and opportunity for communities to get involved again in good relations um, work. Um, I mean, cross-border relations, especially those um, living and working in border areas, um, is vitally important as well. Um, and I know Declan had mentioned that in terms of, of cooperation. Um, so I think, I mean, there is, there is work out there. We're involved in um, work with the International Fund for Ireland, uh, again, which is very much addressing diversity, um, working with both communities and also on a cross-border basis. Um, but I mean, there's always room for improvement, and I think there's always um, additional support that can be given to, to work with, with rural communities and, and rural people. Hey, hey John. Um, um, Claire, 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 you're, Claire, you're here yeah. now? You're here. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, Claire, we got you. Thank you, um, and thanks a million um, for your follow up presentation there. Uh, I think you've made a number of really interesting uh, points. I suppose I'm thinking, I'm looking here at the um, the membership of the subgroups um, that we've been given and just sort of picking up on what Louise was saying about, you know, having to actively ask to be included within the, the, the process of that. So the working group membership, um, so you're pointing to the, the lack of um, women being included or the needs that rural women do have and young people as well um, so but rural women's network wasn't included in the employment or the innovation and enterprise um, subgroups for example that you were part of the connectivity um, I can see that uh, rural action were on well-being um, but it was invest NI tourism NI on the innovation and it was um, you know the colleges and invest NI again on on the employment so I'm just really thinking, you know, did you have to pick one where you offered um, a place or a input into all the, the, the subgroups? And it links into, I think, what Teresa was, was saying about trying to get groups um, or projects shovel ready, I suppose. So, what, so how far were, were you allowed to be included in the process? And you know, what kind of project readiness needs to be done, what was what would that look like and what kind of resource and efforts would need to be put into that? Um, if I if I can pick up on, on just what our experience was on that, and I don't think we were being deliberately excluded. I got no feeling about that. I think it and I suppose that is why I think it's so important to have the co design, co production process in place. Uh, and and you know there internally so that no matter what is being um discussed at, at a region wide level on behalf of the department that you know the key stakeholders are there i mean we're funded we get funding from the department for agriculture so they recognize us as a key actor and stakeholder we have got 300 member groups and we have about another 400 individual members and what ideally had i known that this was coming down the line um, not only would I have been getting myself and my staff ready um, to sit on these groups, I would have been getting our member groups ready to sit on these groups. That didn't happen. They were up and running before I knew about it. I didn't get to the very first meeting of that connectivity group and my calendar was such that that was the only one I could actually commit to. I did try to get on to the isolation one as well, um, but it just didn't work out. Again, it wasn't an issue, I think, of being actively excluded. When I asked to be on, that wasn't a problem. Um, it's about the process, and, and I think we just got missed, and I, I don't think it was deliberate. But I suppose it highlights to me that there is an issue around process when you start 
an enterprise of this nature and it is big and it is vast um that your your first question has to be who is in the room and then your next question is and who is not in the room <laughs> and that's a question to ask even the participants who are there um you know that don't assume that on day one you've got it all right and that there there isn't somebody else that should be included i mean i do think it was important um and i suppose it goes back to to the previous question um that those other statutory agencies like Invest and I do start from from the beginning of these projects getting a steer on what it is that rural people need so that they do then invest in our rural communities and they do see the value of what what needs to be done and they hear it from from the people that is important I mean I have no issue with those people being in the room at all I think it's really vital that they're there um and I think um the assumption has historically been that um, DIRA does rural and the rest of us, the rest of the departments and agencies don't really need to worry about it, that if it's rural, it's their department, um, which is obviously not the case. And hopefully the Rural Needs Act will start um, playing a bigger role in that. Um, I'm sorry, you asked me something else, Claire, and I can't remember what it was because I didn't write it down. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're all right. I think it was yeah. more towards trees. Yeah. About being project ready, and I think it links into that, you know. So it's about you know starting at the right place, having the right people in the room talking about all that there. But we know that some of the um pilot projects are up and running. I think you made mention of that at the start there as well. But you know, it's that thing about what is it that we're supporting, what is we're driving forward. So if you feel that there are other projects there that could potentially be moving forward, and you need to get them project ready, what kind of resource or work needs done, you know, from now to get them ready to be able to tap into that? Yeah. Well, I suppose um, in terms of the investment readiness that I was mentioning, it's around that whole ideas generation, trying to um, realise the potential that's in communities, um, you know, innovation to support them and maybe identifying the need for their project and being able to articulate that in an application process. The whole project development, um, I mean, we've already heard a lot of talk about planning. A lot of projects require planning. There's a lot of work goes into that um, in terms of early stage, you know, design, et cetera. Um, also, the financial issues, you know, how are they going to sustain the project, match funding. Um, I mean, we're involved um, ourselves in RCN and providing some pre-application support currently to one of the pilots, the, the social enterprise um, pilot and I mean we're already seeing you know organizations coming forward there that um, have the potential um, and have a really good idea but they may just lack some of the um, capacity to move forward into the application process so it's about trying to harness what's out there and work with communities um, to get them to the stage where they have a project that is capable of being invested in um, and it does require effort I mean I think sometimes people think that um, you know you, you can just go from project to idea straight on to the application form. There's a lot of things in between, um, and if supported, um, it should generate much more sustainable projects. So I think it's important to see it as an output or an outcome in itself, um, that project development support. Um, and I think it's something that we would think is integral to any uh, funding program moving forward, and not just to focus on the grant um, process, but you know the, the pre-development stages. Thank you. Um, thank you, Claire. Thank you, Teresa and Louise. Um, Pat, Patsy, Patsy Malone, can you hear us? Yeah, Chair, yeah. thanks very much, and thanks very much, everybody. Sorry, I had a bit of a, a computer blip in the middle of it all there. My, my uh, computer went down on me in the middle of it, so forgive me if I missed a bit. Mm -hmm. um, thank you all for your contributions. Um, my, my query is just um, specifically about uh, policy development and how things Okay, we talked earlier, I don't know why you were listening earlier when the department was up and we asked a number of questions around different aspects of policy. But uh, in relation to specifically uh, the rural isolation bit and how things have uh, changed and probably been exacerbated by COVID-19 and what sort of um, solutions or opportunities you might see to that and who with and how policy in it, because obviously we all attended the, the event back in uh, January and up at Lockery, but it's, it's how things have changed there and how we need to adapt because some things will be adapted, we hope, temporarily until vaccines are rolled out and the community and society becomes a safer place, but there will be other things that will have changed 
probably permanently and how, how we can develop that and what sort of opportunities there might be or what sort of um, voids you might see in policies that could be developed on, in rural development especially. Yeah, well, if I may, sorry, no, I'm, I'm happy for you to go first, Teresa, if you want. Yeah, no, I was just going to, I mean, reiterate a few points maybe that was already raised around the whole community infrastructure um, and the need maybe to support that and the role of volunteers, um, especially when we're looking at um, rural isolation um, and the built um, infrastructure as well around the, the valuable contribution that rural halls and church halls and community halls play in, in encouraging people to get out to activities. And I know we're in a, in a, a different position at the minute, but, um, you know, those communities have put a lot of effort into still trying to connect um, with their, their rural residents um, throughout the, the, the pandemic. So um, I think there's, there's definitely scope, scope for that. You mentioned, Patsy, as well, domiciliary care um, in the earlier discussion. Mm -hmm. And I suppose I, I've mentioned employability as well. And I suppose I can't stop but think back to the old ACE schemes that run um, in rural areas um, and urban areas um, many, many years ago. And the potential there for assisted um, community enterprises or community employment, um, mm -hmm. which can support rural isolation and um, can help older people remain in their homes, etc. cetera. Um, so I think that we might need to, to rethink um, what our needs are and how we can give people a purpose um, in rural communities and maybe look to some of the things that happened in the past um, and to join that up a wee bit more better again in the future and create opportunities for young people to develop new skills and okay. maybe tie them in with their community infrastructure, maintain community halls, etc. So um, I think there's loads of opportunity there, but those would be the key things that I think in terms okay. of addressing rural isolation that we might need to look at. Thanks, Teresa. Um, I would echo Teresa's support of something similar to the ACE scheme because I think um, all those things about addressing isolation and giving people a purpose, it also gives people, in, they became invested in their own local mm -hmm. community again and, you know, whenever you've been the recipient of the, of the value of community infrastructure and community support, then you then continue the rest of your life investing in it. I mean, that's why we're all involved in that. And I suppose that there's real opportunity and people feeling part of, of the space they live in. Um, things that we have noticed in terms of change um, as a result of COVID is obviously is the use of space, either whether it's for mm -hmm. that kind of distribution activities, um, and, uh, you know, of, of food and support. Um, but also then the lack of use of space, people can't come together and meet like they did. So um, I know certainly for our member groups, they're really feeling the difference of that. We're providing a lot of things online for our groups to kind of fill that gap. But, you know, we'll not go down the road of broadband, but I mean, it only works if you have if you have the, the, the facility for that. Um, in terms of um, COVID, I think it did show remind communities about how dynamic they are and how capable they are of doing things at speed in their local communities and mm -hmm. how much their local knowledge is vital. Uh, I suppose I was kind of making that point earlier. I don't know if you caught it or, or not, Patsy, but um, it's all very well government having interventions to support a crisis, but they actually needed the groups on the ground in order to actually deliver mm -hmm. it and to inform them back up. And I think there is a huge opportunity to build on that um, reconnection between between government and people. Um, I would say that my, my experience with our members currently is that people are absolutely struggling with their mental health right now. Um, we're, we're certainly seeing, uh, I don't know whether, I think it is a shift. I, it is a definite shift even from the, the first um, early stages of this pandemic where I think people thought there was an end and I suppose we're in a different time of year and different weather. And, and, and I think, you know, poverty and economics is coming in to play in that as well and, and the pressure people are feeling economically. So I think that is is a key emerging need, not just for the department, but for, for all okay. the departments and the executive as a whole. Uh, if I could, Chair, just pick up on that. Um, the, the issue of um, <clears throat> mental health in particular. Um, now, it's 
it again have you given any thought to this and we were talking about the A schemes and we know how the A schemes mm -hmm. some places they worked well some places they maybe didn't work so well um, but uh, by and large they were supportive and work was being done around particularly pensioners homes and people with disabilities or people who are vulnerable um, but the where, where you have situations where um, at the moment and probably for quite the foreseeable future the access to services and mental health services and the likes of that is can be curtailed unless you're doing uh, telemedicine which can be okay in some cases and other cases maybe not so good have, have you done any work or has there been any throwing this out here have you done any work with the the trusts any even initial tech tech and work with the trust to see is there a further role there for the community and voluntary sector in being supportive either maybe through um additional uh, training been provided to volunteers as to how they can handle people and deal with people uh, especially in their access work and their their connectivity work that they're doing um in some instances, day and daily, out and about with people. Um, is, is there any thought given to that as well as to how the, the sector or sectors can uh, work with the trust to, I'm not saying, sub, not saying uh, supplant the, the work of the trust because that's necessary, the professional work, but maybe upskill volunteers to help out that bit more? Um, we certainly have had the conversation with the health committee on on the impacts, um, Patsy, maybe not um, really in, in the terms of what you're talking about, volunteers. What I One of the changes that we also have noticed, and I'm sure it's, it's the same for uh, everyone, volunteers tend to be of an age where um, quite a number of them are retired. They're definitely in the older age bracket, mm -hmm. and lots of them are shielding or at least being very super careful about minding themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, so the number of volunteers, uh, of available volunteers, has reduced. And I suppose mm -hmm. that comes back to Teresa's point, how do we engage younger people um, in their communities in volunteering? You know, what kind of um, incentivization could we have for that? It's not mm -hmm. to say there aren't any young people doing these things. You know that it's a generalization in terms of, I suppose, the, the, the age profile of volunteers tends to be absolutely on, on the older end of the spectrum. So I guess if we were to do something, and that's a good idea, um, Patsy, in terms of upskilling volunteers, um, we may, there may be a recruitment issue in terms of volunteers first. Okay. Okay, thanks very much for that. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Louise. Uh, and hi. Okay. Thank you very much, Chair, and ladies, uh, Louise and Teresa. Funny, I'm just sitting here and I'm using a girl's brigade pen, which I don't know why, <laughs> but I thought to myself it would be wrong not to ask, have you had any input or conversation with the GB? Thank you. Is that, that's to me, is it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, we um we have had um you know almost daily engagement with our members at some periods of this pandemic and we we do have um certainly weekly um conversations and easings go out we have an engagement officer who's whose job um she started on the 1st of April and our vision, we were so excited about getting an, an engagement officer who could be out and about with our groups, which is what our groups have told us they want, somebody to be able to see them face to face all the time. And and she has been doing all of her work, phoning people and emailing people and, and um, video calling. So um, we, we have, um, they are a member group. So yeah, they will have been um, getting um, all of our information and support um, through this period. Yeah. No, that's great, thank you. Just when I'm using a pen, I'll be wrong, not that. <laughs> thank yeah, you stop. very much. Uh, Rosemary? Thank you. Just just a short uh, question. Um, in Fermanagh, we had once upon a time women in agriculture group. I'm sure mm -hmm. you remember that. Mm -hmm. There is a huge problem with getting funding for this group. This group actually folded because of the great difficulties of getting funding because it was a ladies group, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, is there any way groups like that could be reformed again? Um. Actually, um, your area in Fermanagh is one of our key target areas for this year with our engagement officer, Rosemary. Um, we are not 
a funding organisation. Um, we barely survive ourselves on the funding that we get. But I will tell you, it will be no surprise to you, rural women get 1.3% of the funding um, available from our executive for women. So there is a huge um, funding disparity for rural women. It's historic and um, and it, it has exactly the impacts that you're talking about, that um, organisations that are providing valuable service um, are not able to survive. So it might be something um, the programme wants to consider in terms of being able to target women as part of a new um, rural development programme. Um, but I think it's certainly an issue um, for rural needs. Um, because there was no executive in place for three years, it has been really difficult for us to challenge that underinvestment because to do that would have required creation of new policy and new decisions with new ministers to make them. And now we've had the COVID pandemic and, and it's still very difficult to have those conversations because people are rightly saying, I suppose, in the departments, um, this is our priority right now and um, we'll get back to you. So um, any pressure that the department can put to bear on that would be greatly welcome. Thank you. We have I was going to say we have the ability to support and develop any new or existing group. That's what we do, um, and connect them um, even to, to alternative funding streams that, that are not mainstream funding. Um, but we don't. We're not a funding organisation. We can't provide funds much as we would like to. Can I just come in as well, there, um, Rosemary, just to say that maybe to reiterate the point I made earlier about the restrictions between capital and revenue. Um, allocations and I suppose um, a group of that nature maybe was more akin to look for revenue funding and sometimes revenue funding is what's very difficult to secure so it's just to highlight that um, issue as well that um, sometimes there's more capital available and revenue is where the difficulty um, rests so um, that might be a challenge um, that they've been presented with. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I have no other members who have indicated they want to ask any more questions. And uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Louise and Teresa and Aidan for attending this morning. And obviously thank you as well for the ongoing great work that you do in your own organisations and out there in the community as well. So thank you all very much. And uh, I'm sure like yourselves, you're looking forward to the consultation opening for your, yourselves and indeed your wider membership mm -hmm. to have their say on this important uh, new policy. So thank you very much for coming here this morning. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Uh, okay, can I refer members to the draft press release and the table of papers? Um, are members okay with that draft press release in relation to the, the new yeah, policy? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay, the next item on the agenda is item number seven. It's uh, oral, oral evidence uh, relating to the common framework for fluorinated greenhouse gases and ozone depleting uh, substances. Um, uh, the, um, we have a memo from uh, Barbara at page 51 to 61 in the pack and correspondence uh, from um, and a summary of the proposed framework from the department of page 62 to 65. I'd like to at uh, this juncture welcome Colin Nugent, uh, environmental health officer uh, via Starleaf and I'd like to invite uh, Colin to begin the uh, presentation and then obviously we will um, we will ask some questions. Okay, thank you Colin, you're very welcome. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, and good morning to the committee members, too. Um, I have briefed you recently in relation to some of the statutory instruments that are required uh, to allow the new common framework to uh, take effect appropriately. So uh, my briefing to you this morning will be uh, brief in nature, uh, but I'm very happy to take any questions that uh, you wish to uh, afterwards. So the reason uh, the United Kingdom is developing this framework is to ensure that our efforts to tackle climate change and protect the ozone layer uh, remain in place after the transition period ends at the, the end of this year. Uh, the reason for that is that much of the legislation that's in place in the United Kingdom is based on European Union obligations and are designed to ensure that we also meet our international obligations in the Montreal Protocol. Uh, the reason for uh, the framework and the statutory instruments that I briefed you on recently are to ensure that uh, uh, the EU regulations, which are mentioned in Annex 2 of the Northern Ireland Protocol, uh, remain in place in Northern Ireland. So whilst the framework, you will note, is a UK framework, 
you will see that DERA has a watching brief rule and observer status in relation to that uh, framework, but it does mean that we will continue to align ourselves with the, the EU obligations and the NI protocol. Uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, the, the prevalence of ozone depleting substances is relatively limited. Those have been phased out over a long period of time in accordance with the Montreal Protocol. In most developed countries, they're only still in use in some medical practices and in some laboratory use. So we envisage that the scale of use in Northern Ireland is quite limited. In relation to fluorinated greenhouse gases or F gases, uh, we anticipate that the market is much wider. Those are widely used in relation to uh, refrigeration, air conditioning, uh, heat pumps, uh, some medical uses. So they're much more pr prevalent in society. Uh, we also envisage that the macro scale use of these products in Northern Ireland, so in other words, the bulk importation or the bulk use is quite limited. It's those kind of macro scale uses that would be important to maintain compliance with EU quota, for instance. In relation to the micro scale, we believe uh, there's much more activity in relation to Northern Ireland. So for maintenance of refrigeration and air conditioning systems in Northern Ireland. Uh, we believe there are at least 3,000 EU certified uh, maintenance operators who conduct business throughout the, the island of Ireland. So we cannot uh, precisely state if they work only in Northern Ireland in relation to those areas. So in relation to that, uh, this framework is designed to ensure that the integrity of the UK's efforts to tackle climate change and ozone depleting substances will remain in place after the end of the transition period. I'll stop there and uh, take any questions that you might have in relation to that. Um, okay, uh, Colin, uh, thank you very much for uh, that presentation. Um, okay. Um, I suppose, Colin, uh, what's one of the, the one of the questions uh, I do want to uh, ask you about is um, in terms of, of uh, the, lo the local impact. You know, it said that there's three thousand um, operators who may be impacted here. Is any overall assessment of the overall impact that it will actually have here in terms of uh, the, this um, concordat being, being implemented or this framework being implemented? Yeah. Um, well, in the UK, there's a lot of information for the UK, so it is uh, uh, not that precise to be able to break it down for Northern Ireland solely. But the value to the business sector in the UK in 2013, uh, for which the latest data is available, was estimated to be between 2.1 and 2.5 billion pounds in that year. Um, in the whole of the UK, there's about 50,000 technicians registered for working with these types of gases and products. So to estimate that there are about 3,000 in Northern Ireland is, uh, is what we, we seem to be uh, the accurate figure. Those, of course, are operators who, who work at a local level with uh, refrigeration equipment, air conditioning, etc. Uh, I also mentioned the macro level, which is quite important, and we believe that there are only two companies in Northern Ireland who are registered for bulk import, uh, one of which is required uh, to have quota in the EU system. Um, so that's a refrigeration company based in, in Northern Ireland, and the other one is a precision engineering firm, which uh, also imports bulk uh, products such as uh, fluorinated greenhouse gases. Uh, uh, we estimate that in terms of emissions of our greenhouse gases, we estimate that about uh, th only 3% of the emissions of greenhouse gases is accounted for by uh, these fluorinated gases. However, to counterbalance that, the uh, global warming power of, of uh, fluorinated greenhouse gases is, can be up to about 40,000 times stronger than carbon dioxide. So on balance, it's still quite an important sector. But generally speaking, it would seem that the Northern Ireland uh, sector is quite small compared to the rest of the UK. Okay. Um, thank you, Colin. Um, Philip, are you here, sir? Philip? Come on. Yeah, uh, yes, yes. I, I just have a couple of questions. One, just in relation to uh, the administration of, of it. I mean, I, I note on page 16, it's saying that consent to certain functions uh, 
being administered in, on behalf of the, the devolved areas by the Secretary of State, I direct the Environment Agency to administer functions on behalf of the devolved regulator. So I'm just wondering why that is the case and on what areas. And then just quickly have another uh, couple uh, of questions. So, I mean, it's saying that the framework is replicating what currently happens, uh, EU uh, arrangements. So just looking clarity on that. And then also that DERA have stated that the framework is imp impacted by the protocol. How, you know, in what way is the protocol impacting in the framework or the other way around? And how will the framework be impacted by any future relationship with the EU? Shen Shen, can I hear that? Okay. Uh Thank you. Uh, first of all, your, the the situation to date has been that the uh, the UK compliance with those international obligations, including uh, the EU quota management system, has been handled by the Environment Agency and GB on behalf of all UK authorities. So, to enable the new framework to work correctly. Uh, some consent and direction was required for the GB authorities to ensure that the Environment Agency would continue to do that. Um, and we had also planned that that would be the case in Northern Ireland prior to the Northern Ireland Protocol. So the requirements of the, the Northern Ireland Protocol requiring that uh, Northern Ireland only remains in the EU, so that the Environment Agency and GB will only manage the new GB system for uh, those other administrations. Northern Ireland is required to remain in the EU system. So uh, we have been offered assistance by the Environment Agency to continue that work, but by and large the competency for that will fall to DERA. Uh, the, uh, to the, uh, the relations with the EU was the, your last point of the question. Um, the, the EU regulations that govern uh, the controls on FGAS and, uh, and ODS are due to be reviewed next year in 2021. Uh, that is to try and bring it into to alignment with the Kigali Amendment of the Montreal Protocol that took effect earlier this year. So it seems certain that there will be some changes to EU law, uh, perhaps next year or the year after, which Northern Ireland may be required to continue to follow. But there's no reason to expect that the GB system would not also follow the same requirements. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, hi. Okay, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Carl. Um, I was just wondering, per head of population or even by land mass, how much we actually produce here compared to other countries? Thank you. That's a good question. I don't think we actually produce any of these products. So there are countries that manufacture these gases for use in various sectors. I think Northern Ireland is a user of these products rather than a producer. But uh, I, I'll assume that perhaps you might mean emissions, uh, and I, I think that that's yeah. certainly a risk. If, it's, if F gases are widely in use in the country, there is a chance that uh, indirect emissions could take place. And it's exactly those emissions that are designed to be controlled by the legislation we are talking about today. And I mentioned the certification standards that the EU has in place for operators who maintain uh, refrigeration and air conditioning, for example. The training that those operators get uh, trains them how to control and contain emissions and how to capture waste gases and ensure that they are disposed of correctly so that none of them are allowed to escape into the atmosphere. So by ensuring that we continue to comply with the EU certification scheme in Northern Ireland, we should be in a good place to ensure that anyone working on this equipment is adequately trained and fit and proper in terms of their application to that role, ensuring that there should be no emissions. Okay. In and, and terms of um, reduction and goals and what you're aiming for, I mean, is there anything we're going to have to do without because of this, or is it basically just because we're tightening the whole system up? It's not as if uh, we're going to have to make do without some things, is it? Or yeah, well, none of these requirements are actually new as a result of this framework or indeed as a result of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, so these requirements have been in place for some years and do stem from the Montreal Protocol in the 1980s. Um, there have been some changes through the Kigali Amendment, so I guess in the long term we will have to look to the future uh, to some of the phase down or phase out of these uses. I mentioned at the beginning that ozone depleting substances have been largely phased out in Europe and the phase down of uh, many of the most uh, 
uh, many of the, the, the HFCs, the hydrofluorocarbons that have the highest global warming potential has begun to be phased out from the beginning of this year. So I think businesses are very familiar with those phase downs and alternatives are available on the market. So I think in the future, you'll see alternative gas has been used for refrigeration, alternative gas has been used for heat pumps that have much less global warming potential. So I think in terms of, of uh, our current requirements and our current policy, that does not change, but it could change in the future to stay in line with those phase downs. Well, the important thing is that there, there are alternatives, so that's fine, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, um, Rosemary? Thank you. Um, thank you for what, what you've said. It's in relation to the, the, the European law. Will Great Britain have to follow that in many respects? For example, because we're sort of caught piggy in the middle, if I can use that word. We have the, we have the Republic of Ireland and we have the, you know, Great Britain. So uh, will they, will Great Britain, do you think they'll fall in line with most of the European laws in relation to these? Well, the framework is designed in such a way that when it takes effect on the 1st of January, that the policy and law in the United Kingdom will be identical to that of the European Union. In other words, the situation we have at the moment. I guess in the future, if there are changes, it would be up to the GB system to follow suit. Uh, what that means then for Northern Ireland, as you mentioned, the piggy in the middle, um, uh, what it means is that essentially, uh, it, it is the case today that imports into the, the European Union uh, have to be regulated in, in Northern Ireland as elsewhere in the UK. The difference that may happen after the 1st of January, of course, is that uh, any movement of this product between Great Britain and Northern Ireland would count as an import into the EU system. So uh, whilst we've had this regulatory role in Northern Ireland for the Northern Ireland Environment Agency and District Councils for a number of years, it's never actually been required to be implemented before in relation to movements of these products um, into the EU system. So I've already said that the, we envisage that the bulk import is quite low in Northern Ireland, so we don't envisage uh, that there will be any major requirements in this regard, but there is a possibility that that could happen. Okay. Um, how do you see the framework um, work with the provisions of the Internal Market Bill? Um, it's, well, uh, I don't wish to get into any political discussions about a bill that has not yet been passed. Um, it, 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 from what I understand about that bill, and I'm not an expert on it, it doesn't sit very well with the, the Northern Ireland Protocol. So um, I guess that's something that, that you may have to direct to, to others elsewhere to find out exactly what that means. But certainly, uh, as it stands, uh, to, to maintain the integrity, not only of the UK system, but the, the, the EU system of controlling these very, uh, uh, very important uh, global warming gases and ozone depleting gases, we would need to maintain compliance with the current Northern Ireland Protocol standards. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rosemary and Colin. Uh, Claire? Thank you, Chair. Um, and thanks very much, Colin. I just... Um, First of all, do you, are you confident that this is ready to go um, and there'll be no gov governance gaps come the 1st of December? Or sorry, January, 1st of January? Uh, well, as I mentioned, we, you, you have already considered the, the statutory instruments and the, the statutory rule that's required to make this happen. And uh, my understanding, those are on course uh, for laying. So I don't uh, anticipate any governance gaps. I think uh, uh, one thing that, that uh, we have identified with the European Commission is that uh, Northern Ireland regulators no longer have any direct access to the, the EU system that offer the information about who has quota and how much they have. I think it would be very important for Northern Ireland regulators to have access to that because they cannot carry out uh, proper inspections without knowing what the quota uh, held by particular companies is. So this has been raised uh, with the European authorities directly by DEFRA, and I think it's the case for quite a number of areas, not just FGAS and ODS. So I think, uh, I would like to think that we would have access if we were required to regulate this in the future, but that is a potential gap. 
Okay, and then just under the current EU rules, um, a lot of flexibility for individual um, territories is afforded. Do you think under this new framework, um, that flexibility for tailoring within the UK regions will be there as well? I think the GB system is, is structured in such that it could uh, decide to evolve the policy in a, in a manner that best suits uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, uh, for Northern Ireland, however, as long as we continue to be bound by the Northern Ireland Protocol, we would have to maintain compliance with the EU system. But as I mentioned, we, we do have full membership of the new governance structures for the GB system, effectively. Uh, and we will have observer status in those. So if you like, we will have a foot in each camp. And I think we can follow closely what's happening in both jurisdictions and, um, in essence, decide what's best for Northern Ireland, I suppose, too. And have you any more details on the um, dispute, resolution, dispute resolution process? Yes, that's a good question. The dispute resolution process is built into the framework and it's detailed in the concordat that accompanies the uh, framework. And that's quite common across all of the frameworks and all of the concordats that accompany them. So I think that has been adequately addressed. Thank you very much. Okay then. Uh, thank you, Claire. And I have no other members on the uh, list here uh, to ask any more questions. Um, Colin, I'd like to thank you for uh, coming to from the committee today, and uh, I'd like to be uh, engaging with you in the time ahead. So thank you, Colin, for coming here this morning. Thank you. Okay. Um, item number eight uh, on our agenda is the Sea Fishing Industry Fixed Cost Scheme 2020. It's at pages um, 67 to 116 in the tax. The Minister announced the scheme on the 5th of October to help the static gear fishing fleet deal with the continued impacts of COVID in markets and for the key shellfish species that it lands, typically crab and lobster. The SR provides a legislative basis for financial support to be paid. The purpose of the scheme is to spe specifically address the financial needs of the small full time uh, uh, fishermen from rural communities in the static uh, gear fishing fleet whose key markets for their landings of, sh of sh shellfish species have been impacted significantly by COVID pandemic by providing grant of up to 1250 per month for up to four months towards 50% of their ve vessel's fixed costs. The SR states that the grant is calculated using the fixed costs in the audited accounts in the last three financial years, although some uh, 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 small operators may not have audited accounts. The SR is subject to consumer procedure and we debated in the Assembly Chamber. Uh, Patsy, do you uh, want to ask a question in relation to this particular item? Present there, there. Uh, the, uh, no, no, we, we don't actually. Oh, sorry, we do have, we do. We have Patrick Smith, Paddy Campbell, Ronnie McBride on standby there. Uh, can you hear us, sir? Yeah, it's, it's Paddy Campbell here. I can hear you if you can yeah. hear me. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, Patsy. Yeah, I can hear you too. Patsy Malone is a question to ask. Patsy, go ahead there. Sure. Uh, well, it's not related to this specific scheme, but it's related to the wider policy scheme. I'm sure the, the officials are anticipating what I'm going to ask about is the, the scheme for uh, Loch Ness fishermen, which was run, well, indicatively running in parallel to, to this uh, support scheme and has been raised a number of times in the Assembly. Can you give us any indication as to progress on that particular scheme, please? Uh, can, you, can you hear me? Yeah, I can yep, hear you. Yeah, okay. Yep, that, that's still under consideration by uh, the Minister, Mr. Midlone. Um, there's still a few issues that have to be sorted out, but it's that's all I can tell you at the moment on that one. Can you give us any indication what the issues are that have to be sorted out that that, that are that are hindering the scheme? Because as you can appreciate, this one has been about quite a while, and we're running into yep. Christmas, the mouth of Christmas now. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, officials and inland side have been working very closely um, and busily on this to try and resolve matters. So right. I think. Uh, is, there, is there nothing more you want to share with me? <laughs> I wouldn't. Well, it's, 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 a, it's an inland. It's on the inland fisheries. It's an inland fisheries side, Mr. Whitlone. So um, you don't know that. Very into their area. Sorry, you don't know how to do with it then. Well, we're we're sea, we're in sea fisheries, um, and we deal with the grants certainly. But I know there's some issues that they, uh, I think it's legal issues that they want to address. 
Right. It does. Well, that's, it's all. It's all. Um, the minister is still considering the matter. Want to know? Are you, do do you deal with it or do you not with the grant station grants for that? You're saying we issue the we we will we will be administering the grant scheme, but the policy to do with the scheme um, falls to our non fisheries colleagues. Right. Okay. Um, well, if you're not in a position to well, if you, if you, it's just not your it's not your gig is basically what you're saying. I'm saying that I, I would rely on on my policy colleagues in land fisheries to they would advise us what they want to put in the scheme, what conditions and so on in the scheme. We will administer it. So right, okay. I'll go. Um, right, so there's, right. a, there's a few there's a few issues they're dealing with, uh, um, and once they're resolved, hopefully it'll launch. Right, uh, but you haven't got a green light or. Anything else? It's still, it's still, as we understand it, it's still under consideration with the minister. Right. Okay. Um, Chair, it might be useful if we could get an update on that for our next meeting, please. Yep. Good. That's grand. Thanks Thank very you. much indeed. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, all all right. Right. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, Paddy. Um, good to see something here, small scale. I'm just wondering, how many vessels would there be roughly registered under the twelve meters? First of all, any idea? Thank you. Um, it's in and around 200 vessels, uh, Mr. McKee. It, it'll it'll vary throughout the year. Some drop in, some drop out. But we have it's around about 200 or so vessels. Yes. Okay. And roughly, how many do you reckon, or do you know, will meet the criteria? And how many you expect them to apply? Any ideas? Um, it's my. I wonder if my colleague, Mr. McBride, is on and would have the exact figure, maybe. Yes, Paddy. Uh... I think it can be heard. Uh, we're anticipating uh, with the eligibility criteria between 80 and 100 applications at the maximum. A lot of the registered boats aren't actually active at the minute, okay. and a lot of the boats are seasonal operators and have it's only a, a sort of uh, a recreational type of effort, so they, they have been excluded from the scheme. Mm -hmm. okay. That could increase if necessary. We would have to review the uh, eligibility criteria and consider that, and then reissue advice to those that are considered yeah. ineligible. But it is a possibility. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Thanks. Just when you are online there, um, see one of the eligibility criteria for the for the scheme is to have audited accounts. Um, you know, but but that disadvantage says smaller. Um, People and the smaller fishermen who may not have that. Um, one, one of the maybe I'll go with that one, Ronnie. Um, sure. One of the criteria in the scheme is they must have a turnover of at least ten thousand pounds. Um, so we're not planning to um, compensate people who are not commercial fishermen, fishermen or working at a commercial scale. So we anticipate that those people, most of those people who have turnover above ten thousand pounds. Um, they also have to have uh, vessel commercial vessel insurance as well. So those people will be operating on a commercial scale, so they should be able to provide accounts. Um, and would you be satisfied that the, the majority of the, the sea fish operators would have all those accounts? Um, we have no, no evidence to suggest otherwise. Miss Ronnie, do you have anything to add? Yeah. Uh, the, the reason for fixed costs, uh, the scheme for the fixed cost element of what we're doing at the minute, it really, uh, it's a continuation of the scheme that we ran March to May for the entire fleet, the, 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 um, the smaller and the larger vessels. And one of the uh, areas of concern was from a number of beneficiaries as they were being underpaid uh, for their actual costs associated with their boat because you have these super under 10 metres and you have the, the ordinary ones. And one of the lessons learned when we were evaluating the old scheme was it should be based on actual costs uh, defined by Seafish UK on what is a fixed cost. So it, it, it's uh, it's important to note that when, as these schemes were developed, we had virtually weekly meetings with and four industry representative groups, and they were all aware of it and didn't see the submission of fixed uh, of financial accounts being an issue. Okay. Well, that, that, that's great. Thank you very much for the response to, to that question. Uh, and again, I want to thank the, the officials, your, yourselves, uh, Ronnie and Patrick and Paddy, for coming on this morning to answer those questions. Okay, so are members content that of the merit of the policy and we should move to the next stage, next legislative yep. stage? Thank you. Um, written briefing is the next item, number nine in your agendas. It's the NI variety list. 
Uh, the memo uh, on the department briefing is 118 to 199. This SR um, will be laid under negative resolution procedure anticipated that will come into operation in December. The purpose of the SR is to transpose uh, Council Directive 202 53 EC on the common catalogue of varieties of agriculture plant species and Council Directive 202 55 EC on the marketing of vegetable seed as it relates to listing of vegetable varieties. E directives are um, listed on uh, Annex 2. The protocol and as such will continue to have effect at the end of the implementation period. This means that this jurisdiction will be required to maintain its own variety lists at the end of the implementation period. It was not possible to amend the 2001 regulations to provide separate listings provisions for here and Britain. Therefore, transposition of directives to local domestic law is required. Um, I remember it's okay. Or do want to yeah. it on to the next? Okay. Sorry, it was me. Yeah. Yes. No. Can I ask? Will this will this clear the way now for movement of seeds between Great Britain and Northern Ireland? Yeah, maybe that's something we need to. Uh, I'll have to ask that question. Ask that question to the department. We don't have officials on call, so I'll have to get an answer yeah. to you. Okay. Okay. We're just going to note that and ask the question to the department. All right. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And we can bring this back next week. Yeah, then. yeah because this has been moment. recent issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so uh, okay, if this move on ahead to the next stage then? No, bring it back next week. Oh, sorry, bring it back next week. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, number 10, uh, written briefing on the DEFRA AG32 fertilizers and ammonia nitrate uh, material amendment EU exit um, uh, regulation 2020. Uh, the memo and the correspondence is 201 to 2008, 208 in the packs. It classifies a category two by uh, DERA. The committee is asked to indicate it was content for the minister to give consent uh, to the uh, UK minister to lay this statute instrument in the parliament. It's asked to identify any comments or issues may have to draw to attention of the minister. Council directive rules and requirements around the manufacturing and marketing of fertilizers in the UK are currently partially har harmonized with the EU. This means that in this jurisdiction, there are two regulatory frameworks domestic framework and an EU framework which under which manufacturers can choose to market their products. Such an instrument amends the fertilizer and ammonia nitrate uh, material amendment EU exit regulation 2019. SI uh, 2019 601 replaced the EC fertilizer regime provided for in regulation 2003-2003 uh, on fertilizers with a new UK wide UK fertilizer regime. Uh, regulations number 2003-2003 is listed at Annex 2 protocol, meaning at the end of the implementation period, Regulation 2003-2003 will continue to apply in this jurisdiction, whereas the retained version of the regulation will apply in across the water. The SI amends SI 2019-601 um, uh, to reflect the continued application of EU fertilizer law in NA. It also enables the uh, marketing of UK fertilizers in NA without prejudice to the application of the NA and NA of Regulation EC 2003-2003. Dear states of these regulations make technical changes in order to fully implement the European Union Withdrawal Agreement and the Protocol. Dear have indicated that the amendments will ensure that those legislative measures and the Protocol will continue to fully apply in this jurisdiction at the end of the transition period. Um, we have uh, we have Tom McNamara on standby. If members have any questions, yeah. Uh, okay, we have. Philip and then Rosemary. So, Philip, Rosemary. Uh, Philip, Philip, you've indicated you want to ask a question there. Yep, thank you, uh, Chair. Just, I mean, uh, from my reading of this, it seems to be saying that uh, we were told that the North would remain uh, with uncertain EU laws, uh, and now we're being told that that isn't the case. So, I'm, I'm just a wee bit concerned about that. Uh, so it would be good to get clarity just exactly what rules EU or, or wherever else uh, w w were going to exist and why were we told one thing that we're now being told something totally different. Tommy, can you come on board there? I can, Chair. <clears throat> uh, hello, Philip. Um, that that not actually the case. Okay. These are a weird and wonderful area when it comes to legislation. Um, and the way it exists at the minute is that we are partially harmonised with the EU, and that's across the whole of the UK. So whereas the EU regulation currently applies across the whole of the UK, we also have domestic legislation relating to fertilisers. So that position will maintain after we leave in that 
the European regulation will continue to apply in Northern Ireland. Um, and we will be able to both manufacture and market what is referred to as EC fertilizers. However, because it's partially harmonized, it means we can also uh, allow for GB will operate the retained EU law and they will manufacture a new commodity called UK fertilizers. We will be able to get that extended to Northern Ireland, which means that we will then be able to manufacture UK fertilizers, EC fertilizers. We can trade EC fertilizers um, with GB and the rest of the EU, and we'll be able to manufacture and trade UK fertilizers within the UK. So we will have, effectively speaking, the best of both worlds. Okay, fair enough. That clears it up. Um, Rosemary? Yeah, I, my question was on that. So basically, we can have free trading between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and then also free trading between the EU and Northern Ireland in relation to fertilisers. That's correct. Nothing will change. Fertiliser legislation uh, will, will allow us to maintain the status quo. Nothing will change in, after January 1st. Okay. Thank you. So, members content to note this, I note, yep. note this. Okay, um, Mr. Chair, do you mind if I say something? Oh, sorry, Tommy. Of course. I tell you, it's just um, I was there for the last item. I would be the official for the variety list if you wanted to revisit that. Uh, I'll answer any questions on the Northern Ireland variety list because it would be me that would be turning up next week anyway. Yeah. Who raised that question? Rosemary? Was yes, it was the seats, yeah. yeah. Rosemary raised the question there. Do you want to raise it again, Rosemary? Yeah, it's that? it's in it's in relation to the trading the trading of the seeds, the movement of seeds. Is is that will that clear now for GB seeds to be brought over to Northern Ireland without any problems? No, uh, these this set of regulations merely uh, provides for listing varieties to be marketable in Northern Ireland. It doesn't reference where seeds are sourced and it doesn't concern trading the seeds from GB into Northern Ireland. It's merely permitting that all the, the, the list of variety of seeds that can be marketed in Northern Ireland. So, um, I believe there, there's an SL1 that will be with you for next week, um, which will deal specifically with that issue. Now, it will not, um, we still are stuck with the position that certain seed will not be marketable if it comes in from Great Britain and Northern Ireland. But um, there will be uh, another set of regulations for the committee's attention for next Thursday that deals specifically with that. Right. So you're still not sure about potato seeds coming in, seed or seed potatoes, <clears throat> or seeds, smaller seeds to do with gardening. Well, seed potatoes are not my specific area, although I am aware of them. Um, uh, so they will be contained in different legislation. Small seeds for gardening is currently under discussion and we're looking at mitigation measures as to whether they will be able to come in or not. But the problem then will be, even if they are able to come in, then you're looking at the phytosanitary requirements, which could make them cost prohibitive. Thank you. Okay. Have we enough, Rosemary? That can go to the next legislative stage, then. Try. Have we enough that go to the next legislative stage? Members okay yeah. with that? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> right, item 11, then, is EU exit preparation and delivery update. Liz briefing uh, is uh, in your pack. Um, the version in the pack has an error and has been replaced with an updated version in the table papers alongside a, a paper on the prioritisation of SRs. The update covers the following internal market bill, trade negotiations, implementation of the protocol, unfettered merit access and uh, governance. The members are very forward any questions on the update to Stella by the close of play today for forwarding to the department. Uh, I want to advise that under the governance section we have been provided with a table of priority SRs uh, that you are required to ensure a function rulebook on the 31st of December. These will need to be considered by the committee as SL1s over the next two weeks. Assuming that the committee considers uh, that there is no major issues with the SL1s, the department will move to lay the actual SR in the business office. The SR will come into operation on the commencement date stated in the SR, which in most cases is the 31st of December 2020. 
These ESRs will come back to the committee for consideration once the ESR has completed their, their uh, technical scrutiny. The uh, clerk has been in contact with the examiner's statutory rules regarding how quickly her office can provide the technical scrutiny. However, it does mean a larger than normal workload for the committee meetings on the 3rd and the 10th of December. It may be necessary to organise one or two short additional meetings to clear this work. We'll have a short discussion on this aspect in the closed session at the end of this meeting. Uh, terms of correspondence, this is page 20, 221 to 243. Uh, I want to draw your attention to page 240. Uh, with correspondence to the Department on concerns raised by the Finance Minister in relation to aspects of the guarantee of future agriculture funding. Members will also be aware that the Minister, uh, the Deirdre Minister, issued a press release on the issue and the issue received coverage on the BBC website. Given the obvious concern raised, would members consider an urgent order briefing on the issue to be appropriate? And will members also be content if we write to the UK Minister supporting the position taken by the devolved administration ministers? Is that okay? Yep. yep. Um, are we okay with the remainder of the correspondence as outlined in the, uh, in the PAC <coughs> index yep. sheet, page 215 to 219? Board work program. The draft programs are 245 to 251. A couple of things I want to highlight. Next week, 3rd of December, there's a heavy program as it will be necessary to start the meeting at 9:30 uh, a.m. Uh, in addition to, uh, in addition, there is likely to be a large number of SL ones and SRs to be considered. I suggest, that given that it will be a long meeting, that we take the 30-year strategic plan meeting, uh, item as a written briefing instead of an oral briefing. May be necessary to hold a short additional meeting on Friday the 4th to clear all the items. That meeting will be held here in Parliament Buildings, and, the, and I, as chair, will attend, but other members can attend by Starleaf if you so wish. Uh, you may also wish to note that most of the items on the agenda for the 3rd of December are being taken part by Barbara, and she will clerk that meeting for us. On the 10th of December, there's likely uh, going to be another heavy programme with many SL1s and SLRs to be considered. We necessarily start the meeting at 9.30. Uh, may be necessary to hold a short additional meeting on Friday 11th to clear all of the items. That meeting will be held here in Parliament Buildings and I will attend and other members can attend by Starleaf if they wish. 17th December at the moment, this is our last meeting before Christmas. The uh, Minister and officials will attend to discuss EU exit and strategic priorities for 2021. It's already been agreed to start this meeting at 9.15am as the Minister needs to be away for an executive meeting. Please note that we may have many of the EU exit SRs to clear on that date and it may be necessary to hold a short additional meeting on either Friday the 18th or Monday the 21st of December. The first meeting of the new year is currently scheduled for the 14th of January. Are we okay with that word for our work programme? Um, in terms of other business, um, as one of the issues I, I want to raise um, is I've received some correspondence from farmers uh, who um, are, connect, are affiliated to the Blackface Sheep Breeders Association. Uh, the information that I got from them that is that from the 1st of January here, um, we'll have the same is, is that from the 1st of January 2020, uh, we'll have the same status as the EU for importing goods, including animals. Although not yet confirmed by Dero, this will have implications for the sheep industry. I'm asking Dara to grant the derogation in order that we get your lambs from Scotland back here after the 1st of January without having to be scrappy monitored. Um, are we okay to write to the committee, the department, about this? Um, do you remember any other particular uh, issues you want to raise? Philip. 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 How do you see that? Yeah, oh, I was contacted yesterday in relation to the recommend or the the regulations, current COVID regulations, and how they affect fishing. Uh, so, I mean, I, I was asked to maybe get clarification on angling. Uh, so, at the minute, uh, I think there's some confusion about whether uh, angling is deemed elite in terms of sport so there, there's confusion about whether you can have a group of 15 anglers or individual anglers so maybe if we could uh, get clarification from the department in relation to how the regulations impact on angling or groups of anglers in terms of numbers okay okay um okay we're gonna have a uh we'll have a, just a very short um closed session when the meeting ends here 
to we need a bit of a, a discussion on committee scrutiny of a couple of SL ones. SR. Okay, the next meeting will take place on Thursday at 9:30 a.m. here in Parham Milton. So thank you all very much for attending. For those online, for tuning in as well. Thank you. Assembly committee room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.